Ever thought of strapping a helicopter rocket launcher to the back of a Mitsubishi truck? Well, as you can see here, Ukrainian fighters have. There is no escape from Ukrainian weaponized civilian Mad Max vehicles. But if you see something like this Soviet-era Volga sedan mounted with a remote-controlled 14.5mm heavy machine gun rampaging your way, you should definitely at least give it a shot. And if you think these trucks are strange, wait till we show you what this 1940 SVT-40 Soviet semi-automatic battle rifle can do. Don't be fooled by its vintage look. This gun is far from being ready to be retired. The Russo-Ukraine war has definitely been producing some of the weirdest weapons we've seen fielded in recent history, maybe even ever, but how weird can it get? Join us as we dive into this rabbit hole and reveal the good, the bad, and the downright strange weapons seeing use in Ukraine, starting with oldies but goodies. It's a common misconception that the newest weapons are the best in modern warfare. Futuristic weapons sporting next-generation designs and big capability promises tend to attract the most public attention, but the war in Ukraine has proven that it's the workhorses, the time-tested OGs, that actually get the job done. In Russia and Ukraine's case, Soviet-era weapons have dominated the battlefield primarily by virtue of their sheer availability and ease of use. This doesn't mean they aren't good. Ukraine's Soviet-era defenses like the S-300 and Buk M1 here, for example, seem to have done an excellent job blunting Russian firepower. The AK-74 and all its variants, such as the AK-74M, are excellent infantry firearms. Ukraine's well-maintained and updated T-72 and T-64 tanks, designs now well over 50 years old, continue to hold their own against Russia's newer iterations, or at least what's left of them. When upgraded with modern electronics and munitions, Soviet-era weapons can more than hold their own in the 21st century. This was the case with the Soviet Kh-35 subsonic anti-ship missile that Ukraine overhauled into its R-360 Neptune and used it to sink this jewel of Russia's Black Sea fleet, the Moskva, back in April 2022. There are other examples of Soviet-era weapons being overhauled, upgraded, and flat-out MacGyvered into menacing new packages. Look no further than the trusty RPG-7, the famous Soviet-shoulder-fired, muzzle-loaded rocket launcher that has seen service all over the world, for a prime example. RPGs were designed to penetrate tank armor, though their cheap, mass-produced warheads have been used against emplacements, buildings, helicopters, and human targets since the weapon's introduction in 1961. With plenty of cheap RPG rounds at their disposal, Ukraine has adapted certain warheads for more effective anti-personnel use. Video evidence from early in the conflict showed a fearless Ukrainian demolitions expert taking an angle grinder to a live 82mm mortar round, loosening the stabilizer fins with a couple of hatchet blows, and fitting an adapter manufactured by volunteers, all to fit the mortar onto an RPG booster. No mobile mortar system, no problem. All you have to do is strap a rocket booster to a mortar round like this, and you get a man-portable anti-personnel munition that can be fired from a 15-pound tube. Ingenuity at its best. If this shoulder-fired RPG mortar hybrid didn't get the job done, why not just strap a bunch of anti-personnel grenades in a radial pattern around the anti-tank warhead itself? Well, that was exactly the line of thinking for some Ukrainian frontline units hoping to add a bit more juice to their anti-infantry RPG lineup. Images of makeshift explosives surfaced online revealing just that an RPG warhead with a half-dozen grenades fastened to it, a Frankenstein creation tailor-made for omnidirectional destruction. If the humble RPG is any indication, there are classics in use that are still very functional. And then there are classic throwbacks that are real head-scratchers. With the 75th anniversary celebrations unfolding around the globe, many weapons that played starring roles in World War II have been making their greatest hits comeback in Ukraine. Here are some of the most notable sightings. The Mosin Nagant M1891-30 and its successor, the SVT-40. Back in the heady days of 1891, well over a hundred years ago, Captain Sergei Mosin chambered a 7.62x54mm R cartridge into his finalized bolt-action assembly after a decade of experimentation and pulled the trigger of a firearm that would ultimately become one of the most mass-produced military bolt-action rifles in history. 37 million Mosin rifles were built over the next eight decades, as the rifle saw service in 42 separate conflicts, a remarkable testament to its durability, reliability, and versatility. As you might have guessed, the Russo-Ukrainian War is the latest conflict to feature the time-worn Mosin. 
Updated in 1930, long and carbine versions of the M1891-30 model, the self-same workhorse that helped deliver the Allied victory in the East during World War II, has been seen in service today with Ukrainian and Russian forces alike. Dating back to 2014, Ukrainian separatists in the Donbass regularly utilized the Mosin in sniper roles. Some were doled out to Russian conscripts from deep Soviet stocks after Putin's military mobilization last year. Several of the Mosin's eventual successors, the semi-automatic SVT-40, SKS and the infamous AK-47, have also been seen in use. But this is just the beginning. The water-cooled M1910 Maxim machine gun. One of the strangest sightings in Ukraine actually predates the antiquated Mosin, if you can believe that. Somewhere, someplace, American inventor Hiram Maxim must have been looking on with an amused smile on his face when the armed forces of Ukraine wheeled his revolutionary M1910 Maxim machine gun out of storage. Yes, that Maxim gun, the world's first reliable, effective, mass-produced machine gun, and started using them back in the mid-2010s against the Russians in the Donbass. The Maxim was invented in 1884 and remained in production until 1945, widely adopted around the globe by imperial powers hell-bent on killing each other in two world wars and a host of other conflicts. The Soviets adopted it in 1930, and as the Soviet surplus often did, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, 35,000 Maxims found their way into Ukrainian storage. Many of them were dusted off, mounted onto vehicles, placed at checkpoints and fortifications, and used in other ways to repel the Russian invaders. Sporting protective armor plates and two heavy wheels to add mobility and stability, the Maxim uses the same 7.62 by 54 mm ammunition as many other Soviet machine guns. Capable of firing 600 rounds a minute up to 3,000 meters away, the heavy Maxim is certainly not the best machine gun option on the battlefield, but this great war-killing machine is still showing its effectiveness 131 years later. Old Man Maxim would be proud. Other vestiges of the past have surfaced too. Back in 1947, the Soviet Union produced its last PPSH-41, a workhorse submachine gun used by the millions during World War II. With its recognizable drum magazine and high rate of fire, the open bolt burp gun fired 7.62 by 25 mm pistol rounds and saw use after World War II in Korea and Vietnam. Certain photos showed PPSH-41s and the PPS-43, its stamped steel brother in the hands of certain Ukrainian DNR separatist fighters and internal police units in the war's first few months, perhaps more a sign of desperation than utility. It wasn't the only World War II-era machine gun to feature, though. The unmistakable DPM, DP-27 and 28, the mainstay Red Army light machine gun by 1945, have also been seen with their traditional pan, circular top-loaded machine gun chambered for the 7.62 by 54 mm R cartridge. The DPM was eventually replaced by the more robust PK series of light machine guns that are seen around the world. But lead is lead, and clearly the dusty DPM can still hold its own from time to time. We're not sure how many of these are actually in use, but they are certainly there. Speaking of chunky, relatively unwieldy Soviet-designed firearms that refuse to die, Ukrainian soldiers have been seen firing 80-plus-year-old PTRS-41 and PTRD-41 anti-tank rifles from covert positions. These bulky metal rifles were designed from 1938 to 1939 and produced throughout World War II as a stopgap to help Soviet infantrymen stand a chance against German lightly armored vehicles. The gun was essentially an SKS on steroids. For such a relatively cheap weapon, the weapon's 14.5 by 114 mm armor-piercing cartridges certainly did the job, penetrating armor plates up to 40 mm thick from 100 meters away. Reportedly used off and on by militiamen in the Donbass firing World War II vintage ammunition since 2014, they are still seen on social media from time to time. There are a few honorable mentions on our list. Firearms spotted on the battlefield as old as the ones we've already spoken about, but whose actual use can't be confirmed. These include several Nazi weapons including the MP40 and STG-44 submachine gun, as well as the MG42, the lead-spitting beast whose modern variant, the MG3, remains in use in more than 40 countries. Ironically, while certain Ukrainian units used a Nazi-designed machine gun to repel Russian soldiers, early photos from the war showed American-built Lend-Lease Thompson submachine guns taken from captured Russian prisoners. It's impossible to know if this was a one-off sighting, but its presence makes odd sense, considering the United States shipped millions of Tommy guns to the Soviets, then fighting the Nazis back during World War II. 
adding more American flavor to the hodgepodge of vintage firearms in Ukraine, if Russian state media is to be believed, the Ukrainians have been using US-made M101 towed howitzers firing 105mm shells on front lines near Zaporizhia, an artillery piece fielded by the US Army during World War II. These M101s were allegedly donated by Lithuania back in September 2022. What about imported flavors? 32 nations from tiny North Macedonia to Slovakia, Slovenia, Spain, and Sweden have all pledged varying amounts of military aid to Ukraine since the start of the war. Some countries, like the United States, can offer tens of billions of dollars worth of expensive vehicles, drones, munitions, and equipment. Others, like Portugal, donate grenades, small arms ammunition, some automatic rifles, and firefighting helicopters. That Ukraine has taken this jumbled admixture of arms and equipment and made it work speaks to their pluck and resourcefulness, traits the Western world has come to admire. In this deluge of aid, a long list of modern small arms have flowed into the country. Ukraine is unique in the annals of military history in that respect. An independent country whose rapidly revitalized military operates with such a vast range of amalgamated systems and platforms. Across the front lines, soldiers are now fighting with M4 carbines, M240s, M32 grenade launchers, and M2 Brownings, alongside smaller numbers of submachine guns donated by private American companies. Desert Tech sent its Bullpup SRS-A1 anti-material rifle, an insanely accurate rifle that fires the powerful .338 Lapua Magnum round, while Keltec sent 400 sub-2009 mm machine guns to make up for a civilian contract they'd lost track of. There's even been a sighting of a suppressed American Barrett 50 caliber sniper rifle. To this list, the Ukrainians employ many foreign imports. Czech firearms like the CZ-805 Bren and the ZVI Falcon Op-99 anti-material rifle, British Starstreak laser-guided high-velocity air defense systems, futuristic-looking Belgian FN-2000s, German MP5s, and licensed versions of Israeli small arms like the Tavor and Negev manufactured by Fort, a Ukrainian firm based out of Vinitsia. We've also seen next-generation variants of time-tested designs surface like the Bullpup ASH 12.7 and the Russian-made assault rifle or the AK-12, a fifth-generation Kalashnikov assault rifle introduced in just 2018. Unlike the AK-74, the AK-12 is chambered in the 5.45 by 39mm round, with the Russian variant capable of firing the 7.62, known as the AK-15. With its free-floating barrel, cheaper cost per unit, and stronger construction, the AK-12 features improved accuracy and resilience. Okay, let's get to the juicy stuff. The ripest field for weird weapons during the Ukraine war hasn't really been in a field at all. It's been in the air, where unmanned drones and cruise missiles rule the skies and deliver pinpoint destruction at the push of a joystick. Recently, a Russian blackjack strategic bomber fired a KH-55 cruise missile stripped of its nuclear warhead at Ukraine. Yes, you heard that right. They fired a nuclear-capable cruise missile albeit an older one designed in the 1980s, with weighted ballast in place of its nuclear warhead. But why? The KH-55 cruise missile was first designed in the mid-1970s. Fired from the belly of a Tupolev Tu-160 Blackjack supersonic bomber, the turbofan 200 kiloton yield cruise missiles were the spear of Russia's nuclear deterrent for decades. It may seem strange, but firing an inert nuclear cruise missile makes some sense. Increasingly, as Ukrainian air defenses improve, Russia has seen less success bombarding civilian infrastructure. Cruise missiles are expensive, and Russia seems to be running out. Using older air-launched KH-55 missiles plucked out of storage might be Russia's way of trying to overwhelm Ukraine's air defenses without wasting money on expensive missiles that get intercepted or miss their mark. Russia has tried to overwhelm Ukraine's air defenses in other ways too. Back in March 2022, Ukraine released photos of a partially destroyed mystery munition, resembling a dart released from an Iskander-M short-range ballistic missile. The strange devices were each a foot long, painted with an orange tail, and contained a heat source but no explosive warhead. The findings were puzzling. Experts believed the darts to be bomblets on part of some sort of cluster munition package. Later, they revised their thesis arguing these dart-like munitions were some sort of penetration aid, a Cold War-era device used as a countermeasure to help primary ballistic missiles reach their target. The darts worked as decoys, like the KH-55 cruise missile mentioned earlier. Loaded up with electronic jammers and heat sources, they can attract missiles, full radars, and foil infrared seekers. 
Jeffrey Lewis, professor at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies in Monterey, California, claimed it was a very curious decision by the Russians to use decoy missiles, considering that at that stage Ukraine still lacked the military capabilities to successfully shoot down Iskander missiles. These penetration aids were highly classified for decades, making their subsequent discovery an intelligence bonanza for the West. Another mysterious impact crater, this one far from Ukraine in the Croatian capital of Zagreb, made the world wonder what on earth the Russian military was up to one month into its invasion. On March 10, 2022, an unmanned aerial vehicle overflew Romanian, Hungarian and Croatian airspace, flying 430 miles per hour at 4,300 feet before careering into a Croatian school campus and crashing into soft ground. The local residents were fortunate the drone landed just 160 feet from a highly populated student dormitory. Incredibly, nobody was hurt. Initial theories claimed it had been a Ukrainian army recon drone. Inspections of the surviving wreckage painted a different picture. The presence of Cyrillic markings and a Soviet Red Star insignia prompted an American analyst to identify the aircraft as a Russian Tupolev Tu-141 drone, an unmanned aircraft used since the 1970s. Subsequent investigations revealed that the drone was indeed carrying a warhead. Nobody ever found out whether it had been a Russian drone or was in fact an off-course Ukrainian drone that ran out of fuel. Either way, the crash sparked an international incident, with residents and politicians from several NATO countries wondering how such a drone could so effortlessly penetrate their airspace. But the drone story doesn't end there. Russia has employed plenty of drones to observe and attack Ukrainian civilian and military targets. One of the most unique iterations has been the Zala KUB BLA Kamikaze drone, a short-range loitering munition manufactured by a subsidiary of the Kalashnikov company. The KUB BLA, measured with a wingspan of 1.2 meters, can carry a 3 kilogram payload and travel 130 kilometers per hour. It has a maximum range of 40 kilometers and a flight time of 30 minutes, so it can't be employed far beyond Russian positions, but it can make use of AI technologies on approach, making adjustments and identifying its static target. Several KUB BLA drones were intercepted over Kyiv in the early days of the invasion, sparking theories that they were being used to target Ukraine's president Volodymyr Zelensky and decapitate the Ukrainian government. Some of the most interesting drone footage captured during the war, however, doesn't come from military drones at all. It comes from the cheap, commercially produced drones that the Ukrainians have jerry-rigged for all manner of missions. Using 3D printers, a soldering iron, cheap hardware, and some plain old-fashioned ingenuity, Ukraine's army of commercial drones have now been retrofitted for offensive service, and to great effect. It took lots of experimentation and refinement to engineer a light enough grenade to knock out enemy armor using nothing but altitude and gravity. Very quickly, Ukrainians succeeded in engineering lightweight munitions that did not affect a drone's flight path whatsoever. A real engineering masterclass. War is economy. It's money. One Ukrainian soldier commented on the rationale for making everyday drones more lethal. If you have a drone for $3,000 and a grenade for $200, and you destroy a tank that costs $3 million, that's very interesting. Interesting indeed. Makeshift air-delivered care packages have gone on to achieve global renown, both the deadly and the benign. Viral videos show deft Ukrainian drone operators conducting the wartime equivalent of a basketball trick shot, landing grenades in open tank hatches, underground air pipes, narrow trenches, and populated foxholes from hundreds of feet in the air. In other settings, drone modifications have been shown being used to transport small packages of sugar to frontline soldiers, and even most recently, to steal an enemy radio set from a dead Russian soldier that was subsequently used to listen in on enemy plans for several days. The Ukrainians have thanked their Russian enemy for their default Lend-Lease program. Abandoned and salvaged equipment, most of it virtually interchangeable with what they already carry into battle, provides an ongoing boon to Ukrainian military effectiveness. But not all strange and unique weapons are captured intact. While the Ukrainians will make use of the captured firearms and other weapons for a long time to come, vehicle debris recovered after a skirmish almost a year ago revealed a destroyed Russian prototype tank many believed to be one of a kind. Video footage from a March 17, 2022 clash showed the burnt-out remains of a completely unique tank, a T-80 UM-2 Black Eagle. This particular Black Eagle was in bad shape. Like so many before and after it, its autoloader had taken a direct hit, which promptly exploded and blew its turret clean off. It was an interesting find. The T-80 UM-2 was once part of a next-generation tank development project, codenamed Object 640, or Black Eagle. The first iteration of the main battle tank appeared in 1997. 
At the time, Russia touted the experimental, modified T-80U as something that would easily hold its own against Western main battle tanks like the M1A2 Abrams. It boasted Cactus Explosive Reactive Armor ERA panels on its front hull and track skirts, a welded steel turret, anti-fragmentation screens around the main gun and eventually Drozd-2 Active Protection System, a radar-operated anti-rocket and missile fragmentation defense net that can disable incoming munitions 20 to 30 feet from the tank. Unfortunately and predictably for Russia, the project never got off the ground. The T-80UM-2 never entered production, and the prototype became a trial platform for new systems until, in early 2022, it was lumped into a Russian military column, ambushed north of Kyiv, and utterly destroyed. Perhaps Russia was keen to test out its capabilities on the modern battlefield. At any rate, one of the only tanks deployed to Russia so far to feature an anti-protection system didn't fare well. Remember that saying, desperate times call for desperate measures? Having now lost over 1,600 confirmed tanks in battle, 536 of them captured outright by Ukraine, Russia's real strategy has been to scrape the bottom of the barrel for dilapidated and poorly maintained Soviet-era surplus in its stocks, hastily modernize them and ship them off into the meat grinder for use by ill-trained conscripts and mercenaries. Recent images on social media, for example, show several BRDM-2MS 4x4 armored reconnaissance vehicles being overhauled at Russia's 103rd armored repair plant near Cheetah in Siberia. However, the BRDM-2MS isn't much to write home about. It's an updated version of the BRDM-2, a Soviet amphibious lightly armored vehicle introduced into service back in 1966. Fitted with a coaxial 7.62 machine gun and a one-man turret with a 14.5mm KPVT machine gun, mechanics were shown outfitting the paint-chipped vehicle with new thermal sights and, hopefully, a new coat of paint. Which again begs the question, why? Given the rate of vehicular destruction in Ukraine, operating the four-man BRDM-2MS will be like riding a tin box into battle against the likes of the modern AT-4, Javelin, or Enlor. Yes, it's nice to have wheels when you're an infantryman, but all the time and energy spent modernizing or perhaps more accurately, restoring a vehicle that will barely stand up to Ukrainian artillery, mines and tanks, much less the far cheaper Western anti-tank missiles commonly employed across the front just seems counterproductive, like Putin's entire war. Yes, it may just be for show. Perhaps it may even excel in a behind-the-lines transport role. Nobody knows just how many BRDMs will see combat. But if they are deployed to the front, one Twitter user observed that Russia's upgrades are tantamount to having an 82 Honda and slapping a backup camera to it. They certainly won't protect their occupants. We do know that the same repair plant has modernized oodles of Cold War antique T-62s of all types, the same ones seen on railway cars headed to the front at various stages of the war thus far. Most of these museums on tracks, culled from deep storage, have not seen combat in decades, if at all, and their maintenance records reflect that fact. Most are being fitted with new engines, thermal imaging, bulkier armor, new comms, and better optics. The mere presence of the T-62 in Ukraine, 20,000 of which were being mass-produced during the Cold War from 1961 to 1973, shows how depleted Putin's starting lineup of T-80 and T-72 tanks has become. Attrition has forced him deep into his reserves. The number of T-72s in storage are reported to be far lower than anticipated, many of them mothballed and unsalvageable. T-62s are often used by reserve units in the east and thus kept in better condition. But if they get deployed to the front, no amount of cope cages welded onto the T-62 chassis will be able to protect these relics from destruction. Think of what would happen if all of a sudden the United States armed forces started wheeling M60s out of storage and slapping modern equipment onto them. Sure, it could do something, the same way a T-62 can. If deployed to fortify an occupied town or doled out as a training implement, it could provide some utility. But as David Axe, a Forbes defense writer, said it, there's no evidence the T-62s played any meaningful role in the fighting. There's ample evidence their four-man crews abandoned the tanks at first opportunity. The Cheetah plant has allegedly been tasked with refurbishing 800 T-62s by 2025. As you may have noticed, this list of the strangest, weirdest weapons in Ukraine isn't exactly short, and it's hardly exhaustive. Ukrainian soldiers have reportedly captured one Russian prisoner armed with a Chinese-made single-shot pellet rifle. There is also that iconic image of a Russian Roskvadia member guarding a checkpoint in Kherson with an antique 12-pound Napoleonic-era cannon. It could all be a joke, a stunt for social media, or a decoy to fool the Ukrainians. 
Either way, it's surreal that so many historic and head-scratching pieces have made their way onto the battlefields of Ukraine. Did we miss anything? What's your strange weapon of choice from this list? Let us know in the comments. Russia recently lost the biggest tank battle of the entire war in Ukraine. Could it mean the beginning of Putin's defeat? This bloody battle over the small coal mining town of Vuladar was part of the still ongoing struggle over the larger Donbass region. Vuladar lies about 40 miles southeast of the city of Donetsk, near the pre-invasion line which divided Ukraine from the self-declared Donetsk People's Republic. And since the start of the year, Vuladar has become a killing field for Russian armor, with the largest tank battle of the entire war taking place there over the span of three weeks. In that time alone, Russia lost over 130 tanks and armored vehicles, forcing Putin to rely on mass infantry assaults to try and retake the position. This was a serious blow, especially since tank warfare has been heavily mythologized in Russia since World War II and has also become symbolic of the broader conflict in Ukraine. And the Battle of Volodar showed yet again that the Russian military has some massive issues that won't be fixed anytime soon. Vuladar. Even the name itself has got a kind of Lord of the Rings dark and creepy ring to it, and with good reason. Here's why. While Vuladar has been the site of small clashes and shelling since the start of the invasion, the main battle for the town began on January 24, 2023. That night, Russia began launching assaults on Ukrainian positions, which would quickly turn into a devastating three-week siege demonstrating Russian failures. At that point, Ukraine was still waiting for sophisticated Western tanks, like the US Abrams and German Leopard 2, to arrive. Russia's replacement armor showed up earlier, but during its first deployment in Vuladar, it got absolutely decimated. Without superior firepower this time round, Ukrainians were forced to rely once again on strategy and tactics. Much of the three weeks took on the same pattern, pitched tank battles along dirt roads and tree lines, with Russians trying to thrust forward in columns and Ukrainians firing on them from hidden defensive positions. If this sounds familiar, it might be because Russia took the same terrible approach when trying to take Kyiv last year, costing them hundreds of tanks. Clearly, Russian commanders didn't learn much from that catastrophe and made exactly the same mistake this time around, advancing their unprotected tank columns into ambushes. So how did this latest embarrassment for Putin play out? Because the terrain around Vuladar is hard to defend, consisting mostly of flat, open plains and light woods, it is hardly ideal for stopping a major assault. But Ukrainians used the terrain to their advantage and applied doctrines of combined arms warfare, which Russian war planners clearly haven't picked up on. The key to Ukraine's victory in the Battle of Vuladar was enforcing Russia to fight on their terms. This meant limiting the battlefield and forcing Russian troops to attack where Ukraine wanted them to. To do so, the Ukrainian military placed hundreds of tanks and anti-personnel mines in the fields outside of Vuladar. Due to the flat landscape and lack of cover, any Russian minesweepers were immediately targeted with artillery fire. But Ukrainian troops didn't just put mines everywhere. Instead, they left clear corridors between the minefields, only large enough for two or three Russian tanks at a time to roll through. If the tanks moved at all from the cleared path, they risked having their treads blown off leaving them totally exposed to artillery strikes. But rather than try an alternate approach to get around the mines, Russian commanders made one of the most basic mistakes in all of warfare, attacking exactly where their enemy wanted them to. When Russian commanders ordered their tanks into battle along these unmined paths outside Vuladar, it left them incredibly vulnerable to the same ambushes Ukrainians have employed since the start of the invasion. Hiding in covered positions near the tank columns, Ukrainian hunter-killer teams set up anti-tank missiles on both sides of the kill zone. Without triggering the anti-tank mines, these teams were able to cross the minefields and dig themselves into strategic positions, often hiding in bushes or abandoned buildings. From there they could fire and retreat with little fear of being hit by tank fire. The main tools Ukraine employed for this stage of the ambush were the domestically produced Stugna P and the American-made Javelin both deadly anti-tank missiles, or ATGMs. Sometimes called the Skiff, the Stugna P is a less advanced system, but can still pack a serious punch against unlucky tanks. The Stugna is somewhat clunky, weighing about 60 pounds, 
and relies on manual guidance, requiring its operator to maintain line of sight on the target while the missile is still in flight. But even with these limitations, the Stugner has shown it can be deadly, with a range of up to 3 miles and tandem high-explosive anti-tank or high-explosive fragmentary warheads capable of penetrating modern composite tank armor. The Javelin has proven to be even more successful at obliterating Russian tanks. Manufactured by American defense giants Raytheon and Lockheed Martin, the Javelin has an effective range of more than 8,000 feet and employs a fire-and-forget targeting system, allowing its operator to flee to safety after firing. Once in flight, the Javelin's missile locks onto the infrared signature of its target and flies in one of two flight modes, top attack or direct attack. While its direct attack mode is similar to the Stugner, the Javelin's top attack mode has proven to be the most deadly against Russian tanks. In this configuration, the missile travels in a high arc, coming down on the top of the least protected section of the tank, just above its barrel. Like the Stugner, the Javelin also features a tandem warhead charge, using a smaller initial blast to penetrate hundreds of millimeters of armor, while the second charge creates a cone of superplastically deformed metal which can shred the inside of a tank like paper. Both of these ATGM systems were put to good use outside of Volodar. Among these responsible was Lieutenant Vladislav Bayek, the deputy commander of Ukraine's 1st Mechanized Battalion of the 72nd Brigade, which inflicted much of the damage on Russian armor. Working out of a bunker in Volodar, Lieutenant Bayek used a drone to spot the first column of 15 Russian tanks and armored personnel vehicles. We were ready, he said. We knew something like this would happen. The Russian officers, meanwhile, clearly did not. Lieutenant Bayak waited until the tanks were strung out between the mined fields before ordering a lightning ambush with the command to battle. Stugner and Javelin operators hiding in the tree lines along the fields opened fire, as did hidden artillery positions further from the road, using American M777 and French Caesar howitzers. Each team was assigned a different section of the Russian column to fire on focusing on the front and back vehicles first to create a bottleneck. The result was devastating. Tanks in the column attempted to turn and escape the ambush, only to blow up on the mine-laden shoulder of the road. In turn, each destroyed vehicle made it harder for the rest of the column to escape, with blown-up vehicles forming their own roadblock. At that point, Ukrainian artillery would open fire on the trapped tanks, killing the Russians who tried to flee from their trapped vehicles. It ended in obliteration. For three weeks, this pattern repeated itself, with Russia losing more and more tanks and, incredibly, refusing to change tactics. At one point, Russian tanks became so stuck that Ukrainians were even able to call in a strike by a HIMARS rocket system, usually only effective against stationary targets like ammunition depots. Ukraine also made excellent use of its own older tanks as well. Because they couldn't outgun the Russian armor head-on, Ukrainians dug their tanks into hidden defensive positions. Some were concealed with bushes and camouflage netting, while others were actually buried in the soil, leaving only their turrets. While not effective against top-attack munitions, these dug-in defensive positions dramatically increased the survivability of Ukraine's tanks from head-on fire. And because Ukrainians knew exactly where the Russian tank columns would advance, they were able to range the entire approach for their hidden tanks and artillery. This allowed them to make strikes onto predetermined firing points with high levels of accuracy and not waste their limited ammunition. During each ambush, Ukrainian tank crews also used a range of extremely clever tactics to problem solve and avoid having their positions detected. The tanks couldn't wait with their engines turned on without giving themselves away through thermal signature or engine noise, but needed to stay warm to be quickly fired up for combat. So Ukrainians placed kerosene-burning heaters next to their engines to keep the tanks ready to go on a moment's notice. Similarly, their hidden positions meant that many Ukrainian tank crews did not have a line of sight to their targets, so they improvised by using drone operators to sight in their attacks. This also added an extra level of confusion for the already bewildered Russian forces, as their front lines were pummeled with unseen tank fire. Their own tanks couldn't locate where to return fire, leaving them essentially blind and helpless. If the Russian columns managed to escape the mines, ATGMs, artillery, and hidden tank positions, Ukraine just used drones to shift their firing positions to fleeing troops and vehicles. And for any tanks that actually managed to retreat back through the kill zone, Ukraine had yet another deadly surprise waiting. In one of its recent shipments of military aid, 
the United States supplied Ukraine with up to 10,000 specially modified 155mm artillery shells, each filled with nine individual anti-tank mines and a magnetic detonator. Known as Remote Anti-Armor Mine Systems or RAMs, these terrifying weapons were used to mop up any surviving Russian tanks. When a fleeing column would exit the rear of the kill zone, another group of hidden Ukrainian gunners opened fire on their rear, once again trapping them with a rain of anti-tank mines. By employing this strategy again and again against Russians who refused to try other approaches, you can see how Ukrainian defenders destroyed over 100 tanks and armored vehicles in a matter of weeks around Volodar. After a few successful ambushes, it also became clear to Ukrainian commanders that the Russians are running out of experienced tank crews and commanders alike. One Russian tank commander captured outside of Volodar turned out to be a medic who had been given a brief crash course and then sent to the front lines. Because successfully operating even an older tank takes several months of specialized training, there was little chance that the former medic would do anything but get himself killed or captured. And this wasn't a one-off, but a repeating pattern, with almost every Russian officer captured near Volodar having little to no experience in battle. And incredibly, the tank crews these officers were commanding appeared to be even greener. Most were made up of recent conscripts who had, at best, a passing familiarity with whatever vehicle they were operating. This astonishing lack of qualified personnel, while far from surprising, is yet another sign that the Russian war effort is falling apart. Russia lost nearly all of its experienced tank crews during the spring of 2022, during the disastrous assault on Kyiv. The limited number who survived those early ambushes were sent back to the east of the country as Putin limited his war effort. But those survivors were once again decimated during the wildly successful Ukrainian counteroffensive last fall. During that period, the most elite of Russia's remaining tank units, the First Guards Tank Army, was nearly destroyed outside the northern city of Liman. This was the best trained and equipped Russian tank force operating in Ukraine and was supposed to easily hold captured territory. Considering that even this elite unit was not up to the task, it's no surprise that the green Russian troops sent to Volodar have fared so badly. This is a sharp contrast with Ukrainian forces, many of whom were green and terrified when they were drafted or volunteered to defend their country last February. Even though many of those defending Volodar were relatively recent recruits, they learned on the go and didn't make the same mistake twice. Most of Ukraine's most experienced tank crews are currently elsewhere in Eastern Europe, learning to operate the advanced Leopard 2 and M1 Abrams tanks. Yet even the relatively untested troops defending Volodar were able to pull off another staggering victory. This is a pretty clear indication that the war has decisively turned in Ukraine's favor, both in terms of equipment and personnel. It's also yet another reminder of just how poor Russian military doctrine and planning is turning out to be, as neither field officers nor top military brass seem able to learn from past mistakes. Part of this difficulty likely comes from the very structure of the Russian military, which is made up of multiple, independently commanded parts. This lack of a unified command structure has plagued Russia for years and appears to be at least part of the reason why new conscripts are not warned against walking into obvious ambushes. Similarly, the seasoned troops which should theoretically be spearheading such an assault appear to be in much worse shape than expected. A recent intelligence report from the UK found that Russia sent another elite unit, the 155th Naval Infantry Brigade, into the fighting around Volodar. This force is supposed to be among the deadliest in Russia and was utilized in the largest battles last year. But the 155th suffered so many losses that even before Volodar, it was on its third personnel restaffing since the start of the war. As a result, this supposedly first-class fighting force is now staffed mostly by fresh recruits. Adding to the dysfunction is the fact that the 155th was apparently not being sent into combat together, but instead broken up into smaller units and integrated with other commands. Rather than the desired effect of boosting other units' battle readiness, the decision simply made the 155th entirely ineffective. It certainly doesn't help that Russia is rapidly running out of precision-guided munitions and other war supplies. As a result, Russian forces were unable to eliminate the Ukrainian artillery and ATGM positions before their assault on Volodar, assuming they could force their way into the town regardless. Another reason behind Russia's repeated failures in Volodar and elsewhere relates to its heavy use of private military contractors, or PMCs. 
The most notorious of these is the Wagner Group, headed by Putin confidant Yevgeny Prigozhin. Putin's reliance on Wagner and other groups, as well as the rampant corruption in Russia, has led to a scenario where each is directly competing for the spoils of war. Volodar is near two massive coal mines, one of the main reasons why Russia has spent so much time and blood trying to take the town. But since its resources would only likely be given to one PMC, there is a strong incentive to fight over spoils. So at Volodar, the official Russian military, the Wagner Group, and the Patriot PMC, controlled directly by Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu, have all been competing to make the town their own. As a consequence, none of these groups shared information over the potential ambushes, each hoping that the other would take most of the casualties, leaving them free to take over and plunder the town. Controlling the near 70 million tons of coal underneath Volodar would make either Prigazin or Shoigu far wealthier than they currently are giving them a billion-dollar reason not to cooperate. Of course, this dynamic isn't great for an effective fighting force, and has left Russia at a significant information disadvantage. There's another political dimension to Russia's failure in Volodar as well. It's clear to pretty much everyone but the Russians that the smart move would have been to move elsewhere and avoid the potential of mines and ambushes. Yet Russian commanders have insisted on bizarre pitched assaults possibly because of Putin's desperate need for a political win. Anywhere Russian forces have been ground to a halt, the political importance of not appearing to lose a battle has come to outweigh the strategic importance of withdrawing and maneuvering around static defenses. Doing so would be yet another signal of weakness, especially to Putin's most hardline supporters of the invasion. But even so, after the staggering loss at Volodar, cracks are starting to show. Russian military bloggers of vocally pro-war group have fiercely criticized the endless failed tank assaults. Grey Zone, a telegram channel close to the Wagner Group, posted in early March that relatives of the dead are inclined almost to murder and blood revenge against the general who was in charge at Volodar. And while the Ukrainian armed forces can be glad of Russia's staggering incompetence, we should never forget the terrible price paid by places like Volodar. By the end of the Russian assault in February, the town's deputy mayor stated that Volodar was destroyed, with 100% of the buildings damaged. Of the town's original population of 15,000, less than 500 remain, mostly squatting in ruins and collecting rainwater to drink. While there is no doubt that the battle was a tactical victory for Ukraine, it will also take many, many years before anything can be rebuilt. In any case, it is more than clear that the war's trajectory has changed in Ukraine's favor, and that Russia cannot suffer too many more defeats like this one. But what do you think? Was Volodar a turning point in the war? And will Russia's repeated failures eventually doom Putin's ambitions? Let us know what you think in the comment section below. And don't forget to subscribe for more military content and analysis. Imagine trying to invade a country without checking your combat vehicle storage to see if you have enough T-14 Armatas to actually pull it off. Sounds crazy, right? Well, that's exactly what Putin seems to have done in the Russian-Ukraine conflict. You've probably heard it before, but we're here to say it again. Russia is running out of tanks, and it's embarrassing. But wait, Russia's military is supposed to be a force not to be reckoned with. How did it come to this? Is Ukraine so skilled at getting rid of these tanks, or is the Russian army somehow failing at utilizing the ones they do have? Sorry, had. Let's find out. Here's where it all started and quickly went from bad to worse. For Russia, of course. In the little more than a year since Putin began his full-scale invasion of Ukraine and it hasn't quite gone as planned, Russian troops failed to take the capital Kyiv, facing extraordinary resistance from Ukrainians, as Ukraine began to receive advanced military hardware and support from Western countries, Russian troops were pushed back into the east of the country, becoming stuck in a devastating war of attrition. In both the war's early stages and current state of gridlock, one of the most notable trends are the enormous losses of manpower and equipment suffered by the supposedly superior Russian armed forces. Nowhere are these devastating losses more obvious than Russia's supply of tanks. And trust us, if you're waging war, you don't want to run low on those. While recent years have seen a number of predictions about tanks becoming obsolete, the war in Ukraine has demonstrated that they remain critical to modern land combat, featuring heavily in operations by both sides. Putin has repeatedly thrown huge amounts of armor into the conflict, hoping to overwhelm Ukrainian defensive positions. As a consequence, a February report by the London-based 
International Institute for Strategic Studies found that the Russian military had lost at least half of all its entire pre-war fleet of tanks in the fighting, a figure which has only grown in the months since. In just a single day of combat during March around the key city of Bakhmut, Ukraine destroyed 21 tanks, 23 armored personnel vehicles and 8 artillery systems. And as of early April, experts estimate that Russian tank losses exceed 2,000 vehicles in 14 months, while Ukrainian officials put the figure even higher for reference. True, Ukraine has also taken heavy losses, with Russia recently claiming it has destroyed more than 8,300 of the country's tanks. However, Ukraine has been working to crowdsource reinforcement tanks from the West, while sanctions and international isolation have forced Russia to dig deep into its stockpiles from the days of the Soviet Union. That's pretty desperate. Unable to obtain the high-tech components it needs to build modern tanks like the T-14 Armata, Russia is now relying on hundreds of 60-year-old Soviet T-62s and 70-year-old T-55s. This is particularly embarrassing for Putin, who has flaunted his efforts to modernize Russia's military capabilities, spending billions in an attempt to once more turn the country into a superpower. So how did this cringy story of Russia's armed forces losing tanks by the dozens begin? The losses started during Putin's initial attempts to seize Kyiv. As Russian tanks and troops poured into the country, General Colonel Oleksandr Shirsky, the head of Ukraine's ground forces, determined that the Russian columns would need to advance along two or three major highways to enter Kyiv in their blitzkrieg attack. So Sierski organized two rings of troops to defend the city, one in the outer suburbs and one in the capital, with as much space between them as possible, in order to minimize damage to infrastructure. He also moved Ukrainian artillery and mobile anti-tank units into concealed defensive positions to the north and northwest of Kyiv, allowing them to easily target the highways and saving them from Russian airstrikes. This strategy proved to be extremely effective, allowing defenders to destroy many of the slow-moving tanks. But it gets better. There have been reports of entire companies of Russian armor being destroyed in deadly ambushes by Ukrainian hit-and-run teams using anti-tank guided missiles or ATGMs. While relatively simple, ATGMs have proved to be an incredibly effective tool for destroying Russian armor. There are several main varieties of ATGM currently in use by Ukrainian troops. One is the domestically produced Stugna P, an older class of anti-tank weapon also known as the Skiff in its export version. The Stugna P's launcher and missile weigh a combined 60 pounds, making it a relatively large and heavy ATGM. It also relies on operator guidance, requiring its operator to keep tracking the target at all times while the missile is in flight. But even with these limitations, videos have flooded the internet of Ukrainians using Stugna P missiles to devastating effect. The Stugna P has a range from 328 feet to 3.1 miles, with a missile flight time of up to 25 seconds, depending on the target's range. It can also carry high-explosive anti-tank or high-explosive fragmentary warheads capable of penetrating modern tank armor. One benefit of the Stugna P is that despite being heavy, it can be mounted on a tripod, covered with camouflage, and piloted remotely on a laptop-like unit from up to 164 feet away. This has allowed the Ukrainian troops operating Stugnas to keep their units safe from retaliation by Russian tanks and artillery. And the system is simple enough for inexperienced operators to quickly become skilled, such as 42-year-old Ukrainian MP-turned-soldier Tetiana Chornovol. Chornovol worked as a Stugna operator during the Battle of Kyiv, where she and others used a number of hidden ATGMs to throw Russian tank columns into chaos. As she described it in an interview, we saw tanks appearing and we literally ran to our position. I ran to my operator's case, I switch it on, and I see tanks on the screen. They just entered within the range of my missile. I took aim and destroyed the first tank. I shot it right at the fuel cells, and the ammunition was detonated. The tank literally flew off the road, and now it is somewhere in the road ditch in the forest. We don't know about you guys, but we're pretty impressed with Tatiana. With hundreds or thousands of stories like this, it isn't hard to see why even Ukraine's domestic ATGM system has proved to be bad news for Russia. Additionally, there are three main Western ATGM systems responsible for the bulk of destruction to Russian tanks. 
First is the American FMG-148 Javelin, jointly manufactured by defense giants Raytheon and Lockheed Martin. Ukraine has received more than 7,000 Javelins since the start of the invasion. One of the Javelin's biggest strengths is its trajectory, as its missile travels in a high arc in order to strike the less armored section of a tank at the top of its turret. Javelins can also penetrate even the toughest tank armor, as they are fitted with two warheads. A primary charge disrupts the anti-missile countermeasures or armor, while a second charge penetrates and detonates inside the tank. However, this also makes Javelins expensive at about $200,000 per unit and $78,000 per replacement missile. Cost aside, Javelins have become a staple of Ukraine's defense throughout the war so far, even being turned into an inspirational internet meme termed Saint Javelin by Ukrainian-Canadian journalist Christian Boris. Even as the invasion shifted into its current brutal back and forth of artillery barrages and trench warfare, the Javelin has continued to prove invaluable to Ukrainian forces. But Javelins are just the beginning of our How Ukraine is Obliterating Russian Tanks investigation. Also critical has been the Next Generation Light Anti-Tank Weapon, or NLAW, designed and produced by the Swedish company Saab Bofors Dynamics. The NLAW is shoulder-mounted, weighs only 28 pounds, has no backblast footprint, and has a firing range of 65 to over 1,950 feet. Like the Javelin, it utilizes fire-and-forget targeting, requiring no target guidance after firing. It also includes two fire modes, Overfly Top Attack, or OTA, where the missile uses magnetic sensors to detonate just above its target, and Direct Attack Mode. The NLAW is also extremely practical, as it uses a non-explosive soft charge when fired, meaning it can be safely launched from indoors or enclosed spaces. While less expensive than the Javelin, the NLAW still runs at a pricey $33,000 per shot, but with their larger arsenal of ATGMs, Ukrainians have also gotten very good at mixing and matching, using each system in the tactical environment and situations where it will be most useful. As Anatoly, a member of the 128th Mountain Assault Brigade, currently fighting near Bakhmut, recently told a reporter, I'm often asked which ATGW is the best, Enlaw or Javelin. I will say from experience that it is best to use them in tandem. Enlaw is excellent at close range, so it is indispensable when combat action takes place in urban areas like cities and villages, and the Javelin is best at a range of 1 to 2.5 kilometers, i.e. in the open field. Similarly, against lighter armored vehicles, Ukrainians will often now use the domestically produced Stugners or Corsars, saving NLAWs for strikes on heavy tanks from concealed, often urban, positions. That's another five starts for Ukraine's fierce weaponry, but we're not done yet. Lastly is the AT-4 anti-tank missile, also produced by Saab Bofors Dynamics, a disposable, recoilless ATGM. The AT-4 fires a single shot at a range of 650 to 1,950 feet. Designed during the Cold War, the AT-4 is also highly modular and can be loaded with a range of different warheads, some of which can penetrate tank armor up to 600 millimeters thick. Perhaps the AT-4's biggest advantage is its low cost. Each can be produced for under $1,500 and even less in Sweden. While there are numerous videos of Ukraine's armed forces using them to destroy multi-million dollar Russian tanks, since the invasion began, Ukrainians have also become more and more adept at using their arsenal of ATGMs, making it incredibly difficult for Russia to make any real headway. ATGMs, NLAWs, and AT4s, oh my! Yes, Putin has been served a number of reasons to reconsider his invasion plans, but Ukraine isn't done providing him with a few more. Here's a terrifying and reliable weapon they've added to the pile. Another critical but often overlooked means by which Ukraine has wreaked havoc on Russian armor is with the use of landmines. Some of these are from the Soviet era, but the US also supplied over 7,000 shells of its remote anti-armor mine system, or RAM, in late 2022. The RAM is a 155mm howitzer shell containing nine anti-tank mines. When the shell is fired over an open area, the tiny mines are scattered across the ground. This means that Ukrainian forces can lay the mines from a distance rather than by hand, 
without risking fire by Russian artillery. This makes them especially valuable in open spaces, where they can effectively stop an entire tank force. Ram's lethal power was on full display several months later, when Russian armed forces attempted to take the Ukrainian town of Vuladar. In mid-February 2023, Russian losses due to the mines were so steep that the British Defense Secretary claimed an entire 1,000-man Russian brigade was effectively annihilated in one day. Reports like this make it easy to see how tank losses have become so enormous. But besides Ukraine's growing supply and talent for using anti-tank weaponry, there is another driving factor behind Russia's loss of more than 2,000 tanks, which has to do with its deeply flawed strategic approach to the conflict. Specifically, with the backbone of Russia's invasion force, the Battalion Tactical Group, or BTG, a combined unit of tanks, infantry, and artillery designed for lightning offensive operations. As Russian columns were devastated outside of Kyiv in early 2022, it became apparent that the BTG were not proving nearly as effective as they should have been. Most contained far too many tanks and armored vehicles, with too little infantry support. So when they came under attack by Ukraine's mobile strike teams, there were not enough soldiers to repel the ambush, and Russian tanks were easy targets. This was compounded by Russia's failure to establish air superiority, which meant it was unable to supply close air support for its tank columns, the way the US did in Iraq and Afghanistan. Combined with Russia's myriad issues resupplying its front lines or repairing broken-down vehicles, and you begin to see just how things went so badly so fast for Putin. And because of all the elements above, Russian tank losses have only grown heavier in the following months of the war. During Ukraine's autumn counteroffensive into the Kharkiv region, for instance, Russia was losing as many as 10 battle tanks per day to Ukraine's two, despite the fact that Russian troops were on the defensive. Most of the tanks destroyed were T-80s and T-72s, which began Russia's critical shortage of those systems. During that same period, Ukrainians reportedly captured over 560 vehicles and hundreds of extra ATGMs. Thus, in the grinding stalemate which has followed, Putin has had to rely on older and older equipment, most notably the T-55s and the T-62s. The T-55 is so old, it literally qualifies as antique. The tank's prototype was first completed in 1945 and entered service with the Soviet Army in 1958. But reports indicate that in March of 2023, Russian troops began moving hundreds of them out of the 111th Central Tank Reserve Base in Khabarovsk, where they had been sitting in long-term storage for many decades. A recent photo showing a Russian soldier posing next to a T-55 somewhere in Zaporizhia Oblast seems to confirm their presence on the ground in Ukraine. The photo also indicates that Russia is sending the T-55s to Ukraine without upgrading them, as the tank in the photo appears to have the same infrared optics that were being used in the late 1950s. Similarly, there is no evidence that the T-55s have been reinforced with modern explosive reactive armor and seem to be using the same thin steel body plating as they did during the early Cold War. This may prove to be an especially bad decision, since the T-55s also include the so-called jack-in-the-box floor, which has doomed many of Russia's other Soviet-era tanks. Unlike modern battle tanks such as the German Leopard 2 or US M1 Abrams, which keep their shells away from the crew behind thick armored walls, older Soviet tanks store their ammunition in a carousel-style automatic loader, sitting directly below the main turret and crew, with only thin steel armor a well-placed enemy shot can ignite the ammunition and easily blow up the tank. As Professor Robert E. Hamilton of the US Army War College put it bluntly, for a Russian crew, if the ammo storage compartment is hit, everyone is dead. He adds that the force of the explosion will instantaneously vaporize anyone unlucky enough to be inside. And that's far from the ancient tank's only weakness. As military journalist David Axe has written, the T-55 is from a generation of armored vehicles before modern optics, autoloaders, and multi-axis stabilization for their main guns, passive infrared optics, and sophisticated computerized fire controls. Essentially, all this makes the T-55 far less accurate and powerful than any other tank on the battlefield today, leaving them as easy targets for Ukrainian ATGMs and artillery. The Soviet T-62 isn't a whole lot better. 
It also suffers from poor armor and the jack-in-the-box floor, as well as limited range and firepower compared with any modern tank. First introduced in 1961, the T-62 was once considered cutting-edge, even into the 1970s. Many are equipped with either a TSH-2B-41 or a TSH-SM-41U gunner's sight and active thermal sights, which allow a T-62 gunner to fire about a mile during the day and about half that at night. This is about half the range of most modern tanks, making the T-62 a sitting duck in many situations. In an effort to slightly improve their effective range, Russia has so far pulled more than 800 T-62s from long-term storage and fitted many with 1PN96MT02 analog thermal gunner's sights. These sights are an upgrade from the T-62's original design, but have not been state-of-the-art since the 1970s, and have mostly been long since replaced with digital Sonsa-U sights. But since the Sansa U includes advanced French components now unavailable to Russia due to sanctions, they have had to make do with the older analog sites, making them essentially target practice for Ukrainians. Another huge issue with both the T-55 and T-62 is their discrepancy in barrel and ammunition size. Newer tanks such as the T-90, T-80 and even the T-64 being used by the Ukrainians have the same size barrel and can use common shells. By contrast, the barrel of the T-62 is 115mm and the T-55s is 100mm, meaning both that they cannot use modern ammunition and that they have issues destroying heavily armored targets. Making this worse is the T-55 and T-62's incredibly slow rate of fire, while the crew of a Ukrainian T-64, Leopard 2 or M1 Abrams can fire 10 to 12 rounds a minute, a T-55 or T-62 crew is lucky if they can manage three or four. This reality is likely to get an even greater number of Russians killed in direct battles with Ukrainian forces as they become more and more outgunned. At the same time, Russian tank losses and reliance on older hardware has come hand in hand with catastrophic levels of casualties. The country is so far estimated to have lost some 200,000 to 250,000 soldiers. For reference, that is more than the US has lost in every one of its wars since World War II combined. In response, Putin has been forced to enact conscription, augmenting the Russian front lines with untrained conscripts, hardened criminals, and mercenaries. These troops are essentially forced to attack at gunpoint, and thousands have instead opted to mutiny, flee, or surrender to Ukraine once they reach the front lines. These mind-boggling numbers have also affected the Russian military's ability to properly resupply its tank personnel. Many of the 2,000 tanks already lost were destroyed with their crews still inside, leading to a serious shortage of soldiers with actual experience operating tanks, especially the more modern ones. Ukrainian analyst Oleksandr Kovalenko was recently tracking the shipment of more than a dozen restored T-72s, T-80s and T-90s to a Russian unit near Svatova in eastern Ukraine. But when they arrived, Kovalenko noticed that the most interesting thing is that there are no crews in the unit who can operate these tanks. Replacement crews for T-55s and T-62s can be trained in a relatively shorter time frame, as they do not need to be trained to use automatic gun loaders or sophisticated modern fire controls. The downside of this, of course, is that Russia now has extremely green soldiers using what amounts to rusting, obsolete weaponry. Down the road, this will create even more issues as the crews currently being trained will not be able to effectively operate the more modern tanks, even if Russia is able to start their production. This degradation of manpower and training could prove to be an even bigger issue than Russia's dwindling military supplies, as effective recruiting and training will become harder and harder. Long term, this could spell disaster for the Russian military and perhaps for Putin himself. With no way to replace modern tanks or the crews needed to operate them properly, it may prove impossible for Russia to remain a global or even regional power. The very presence of T-62s and T-55s on the battlefield is an indictment of Russian power and a sure sign that its armed forces are flailing. But what do you think? Will Russia's tank losses be a defining factor in the outcome of the war? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe for more content from military experts. This is Poland. 
Once the tragic crossroad of European empires, it has undergone nothing short of a Western military renaissance in the 21st century and is now becoming one of the most feared armies in Europe. Yep, you heard that right. Poland has become a military beast and Putin really should think twice before deciding to poke this fully staffed, well-armed and exceptionally trained bear. The ongoing war in Ukraine has undeniably influenced Poland's military posture. But with the flurry of spending increases, arms deals and recruitment programs, what exactly is Poland gearing up for and will it be prepared? After what Poland's been through in recent history, trying to pull off a modern military revival is no joke. Within the span of a single lifetime, the Polish nation waded through shattering, simultaneous military defeats at the hands of both Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union a wartime occupation, partitioning, and tragic holocaust, and its complete absorption into the Warsaw Pact as a Soviet satellite for the 40 years that followed. Talk about trauma. During the latter Cold War period, Poland's population doubled. It maintained a decently large standing army, often joined by Soviet troops stationed within its territory. The Eastern Bloc country, led by unapologetic communist officials closely aligned with Stalin's regime, nevertheless managed to rebuild its devastated cities in the aftermath of World War II, slowly raising the standard of living among its inhabitants. Over time, hardline Stalinists fell from power, followed closely by many ousted Soviet officers who had for decades filled leadership positions throughout the Polish army. The 1970s and 80s ushered in an era of turbulent protests and political change. The rise of Solidarity, a widely popular anti-communist social movement, preceded mass pushback to and the eventual breakdown of Soviet authority in Poland. The Poles wanted freedom and eventually took it. By 1991, the dissolution of the Soviet Union created the conditions for democratic elections, Poland's first since 1920. This landmark moment was to be Poland's first major step in its inexorable civil-military transformation, one that would see the nation progressively look westward for models upon which it could base its rapidly developing economic, military, and political systems. Poland's Western integration scared the pants off enemy soldiers, and on September 18, 1993, Soviet troops left the country for good. Just five years later in 1999, Poland officially joined NATO. Five years after that, it joined the EU. But Poland trying to come besties with the West is not a new story. Today, many people forget that though Poland was ravaged by the Axis early on in World War II, its armies in exile fled Soviet gulags and went on to fight gallantly as pilots, sailors and soldiers within the Allied armies abroad. With hundreds of thousands of Poles voluntarily serving in Italy and on the Eastern Front, they fought with hope that they might someday rebuild Poland from the ashes. A new Poland, one free from the tyranny of coercive foreign regimes. Poland followed this North Star as it cast away the vestiges of Soviet control in the new millennium. Ever since, it has progressively sought to become a self-sufficient, independent power in its own right. Even before it joined the EU, Poland sent 2,000 soldiers to participate in the 2003 invasion of Iraq, then the coalition's fourth largest military contribution behind the United States, the United Kingdom and Australia. Poland maintained its presence in Iraq for years, participating in and even leading multinational division Central South, a NATO unit responsible for an entire occupation zone as part of multinational force Iraq. Their deployment lasted until 2008, when Polish troops were finally withdrawn from the country, but Iraq was just the beginning. In Afghanistan too, Poland signaled its solidarity with the West. There for the duration of the 20-year forever war, the Poles proved themselves reliable, trustworthy partners, cycling through more than 33,000 personnel in what constituted the largest peacekeeping mission in Poland's military history. We're telling you, you want these guys to be on your side. But don't take our word for it. Western veterans of these two wars whose tours of duty brought them into contact with their Polish allies almost unanimously praised their martial prowess, professionalism, and battlefield capabilities. Each additional year spent as part of NATO's multinational deployments increased Poland's military effectiveness, interoperability, and trustworthiness. With certain pundits labeling Poland an emergent protégé of the United States in Central and Eastern Europe, the nation has more than demonstrated its unity with other NATO allies, as well as its approval and support of American security policies. Since 1989, each successive Polish government has supported America's forward military presence in Europe, seeing in their ally a source of protection, friendship, and economic prosperity it so desperately lacked throughout its fraught history. 
Poland has repeatedly been one of few NATO countries willing to fulfill their obligations to spend 2% of their GDP on defense spending, a point of friction between the US and its other NATO allies in recent years. With amicable relations deteriorating between Poland's current right-wing government and President Joe Biden, who won the presidency in 2020, Russia's invasion of Ukraine caused a resurgence in Polish-American relations. Ever since, the two countries have reaffirmed their commitment to each other and to their shared desire to arm Ukraine with the weapons it needs to succeed. Great, everyone's getting along. Now let's get down to business and talk about geostrategy and tanks. The latest landmark decision to finally send main battle tanks to Ukraine has renewed attention on the United States and Germany. In reality, Ukraine owes much of the decision's outcome to Poland, who was one of the first countries to pressure a reticent Berlin into increasing its support for Ukraine by asking for approval to transfer its own German-made Leopard 2 tanks. Talk about heart. Jeopardizing its own diplomatic relationship with its German neighbor, Poland acted as a catalyst for consensus, eventually deciding to send its Leopards to Ukraine even without explicit German consent. Arguably, this choice helped bring Berlin and the rest of the West into agreement on the issue. It also demonstrated Poland's proactive leadership role as a vocal opponent of Russian aggression, warnings it has been issuing to Europe since it joined the European Union in 2004. Today, Poland is the security linchpin on the NATO alliance's eastern flank. Strategically placed on Russia's westernmost border, its rapid economic modernization and expansion of its armed forces has catapulted it into 20th place in the list of the world's most powerful militaries. During the war in Ukraine, it has accepted more displaced Ukrainian refugees than any other European nation, several million in fact, providing them access to healthcare, education and employment in the process. Poland also ranks highly in European military aid to Ukraine, surpassing virtually every European nation save their neighbors in the Baltics. To date, they have sent hundreds of tanks, armored vehicles, and small arms to their imperiled neighbor, likewise opening their roadways to an unending stream of international aid flowing into Ukraine in great numbers. What about the rest of the West? Let's just say Europe's old guard have not emerged from the conflict in Ukraine unscathed. Great Britain is no longer a part of the European Union. Germany's initial reluctance to distance itself from Russian trade deals, pipelines, and natural resources, and the French president's dogged belief in the possibility of a negotiated settlement with Putin despite Ukraine's wishes to restore its original borders have seen each country's prestige fall. Poland has wholeheartedly jumped into this leadership vacuum and is now attempting to warn the wider world about the danger posed by Putin's Russia. In a September 2022 speech, the Polish President Andrzej Duda warned the United States General Assembly that this is not just a regional conflict. Russia's war against Ukraine is a potential source of global conflagration. This war will affect our countries as well as yours if it hasn't already. This, then, is what Poland is truly afraid of. For decades during the Cold War, it nervously awaited a war between the Soviet bloc and the West, knowing its borders might once again become Europe's bloodlands. Today, the threat remains. Eastern Europe is experiencing its worst conflict since World War II, and from the start, global leaders have warned against any actions that could escalate into a potential World War III scenario. Last November, this was almost what happened. That month, an errant missile crossed over into Polish territory, detonating at an agricultural grain-weighing facility, killing two people. The event, the war's first strike on territory outside Ukraine, prompted a barrage of coverage. Who fired the missile? From where? Why? Everyone knew NATO's famous Article 5 defense clause in the alliance's founding charter meant an attack on one ally was an attack on them all. Prudently, as the world leaders waited for answers, world leaders, none more patient than Poland, collected and weighed the evidence, ultimately deciding the event was likely a misfire, and ultimately not enough to invoke Article 5. It may not have sparked World War III, but the strike did prompt Polish officials to redouble their efforts to prepare for such an eventuality. Several months before, an opinion poll found that 84% of Poles expressed fears that military action could spill over into Polish territory. Poland, much like Ukraine, knows it could never face Russia alone without the material and moral support from the West. Could it? It would be impossible to predict how a conflict between Poland and Russia might unfold, nor how much support Poland might receive from NATO and the West. One thing's for sure, Poland isn't waiting around to find out. In the meantime, it's doing its utmost to deter Russia by arming and equipping its armed forces in a way that gives them the highest probability of military success. Is it overreacting? We really don't think so. 
In many respects, Poland now sees Ukraine fulfilling the role it was once destined to fill, the linchpin of European security, the first wall of defense against a Russian bear railing in its unrelenting quest to fulfill its imperialist ambitions. Poland has claimed it will support Ukraine for as long as it takes. The nation's historic antipathy to all things Russian and Russia's blatant disregard for its neighbor's sovereignty has prompted a thorough rededication to its own defense through an impressive military buildup. Poland already arguably possesses Europe's best army, but after the November 2022 missile incident, it looks set to get even stronger. And it means business. Since the start of Russia's invasion, Poland claims it has experienced its highest wave of recruitment since it officially ended conscription back in 2008. In 2022, it recruited more than 13,500 professional soldiers, about 8% of Poland's total armed forces of 164,000. With the recent announcement to astronomically increase its military spending from 2.5 to 4, possibly even 5% of its GDP, it aims to increase its overall force structure to 300,000 professional soldiers. This will not only dwarf Germany's 1.5% of GDP spent on defense, it will see Poland almost double its army of 170,000. It is the type of commitment that shows Poland has already become, in the words of a senior US Army official in Europe, our most important partner in continental Europe. Wait, it gets better. The Polish military renaissance means an even tighter defense alliance with the United States, one of its main weapon suppliers. In 2020, the Polish government reached agreements to purchase HIMARS rocket launchers, F-35 combat aircraft, Patriot air defense systems, MRAPs, and hundreds of M1 Abrams tanks to replace its stockpile of the 240 Soviet tanks it sent to Ukraine. It has announced its intention to eventually incorporate American Black Hawk helicopters made in Poland by Lockheed Martin, other multi-role aircraft, and drones to complement its arsenal of American F-16s already in use among its air forces. This is not all. Poland is also ordering billions of dollars worth of weapons from cheaper South Korean weapons manufacturers, with a $10 to $12 billion order for 180 K2 Black Panther tanks, 200 K9 Thunder Howitzers, 48 FA-50 light attack aircraft, and 218 K239 Chunmu rocket launchers. And that's only the used gear. Poland's appetite for new arms is even bigger, claimed one journalist. Korea will eventually send Poland 1,000 K2 tanks and 600 K9 howitzers in the coming years. It has also purchased Italian Leonardo attack helicopters to be built in Poland. Talk about being prepared for anything. What could go wrong? Well, some do say Poland's unprecedented defense spending will strain its domestic budget to the breaking point, but its neighbors are hardly complaining. They know the more Poland spends, the safer they'll be. Poland is acting on its stated desire to become Central Europe's preeminent military power. Many doubt whether their vision will ever come to fruition. Polish military stocks are still heavily based on Soviet-era surplus after all, but the recent influx of American weapons like the M1A2 Abrams into the country, its diversification to the other foreign weapon markets, and its emphasis on recruiting and training a new generation of dedicated soldiers certainly paint a promising picture that it might. And in the eventuality that Russian aggression spills beyond Ukraine's borders, Europe can be assured that if any country will be ready to fight, Poland will be chief among them. But what do you think? Will Poland eventually find itself in an epic battle with Putin's army? If so, are they ready? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. First tanks, and now submarines. Putin can't seem to keep hold of his weapons, with Russia's only aircraft carrier catching fire not once, not twice, but three times since 2018, and his guided missile cruiser the Moskva sinking in 2022, Russia's navy, widely considered one of the most powerful in the world, has seen better days. And now, Russia's submarine power is under serious threat. Here's why. It's no secret that things haven't been going well for Russia from crushing sanctions to staggering military casualties. Putin's invasion of Ukraine has backfired in a host of unexpected ways. It has also highlighted profound weaknesses in Russia's military capabilities, exposing them as aging, corrupt, and poorly led. Nowhere is this more true than at sea. Despite statements by former Russian President Dmitry Medvedev back in 2009 that, without a navy, Russia does not have a future as a state, the country's surface fleet remains embarrassingly inept. 
Former U.S. Navy Admiral James G. Foggo recently noted that it has been allowed to atrophy due to factors like poor maintenance, low funding, and corruption. This trend has been on full display during recent years, with the Russian Navy suffering a number of embarrassing high-profile mishaps. Its only aircraft carrier, the Admiral Kuznetsov, nicknamed the unluckiest ship in the world, has caught fire at least three times since 2018. Earlier this year, Ukrainian intelligence assessed that the ship is in critical condition and not capable of moving under its own power. That's not to mention the sinking of Russia's Black Sea flagship, the Moskva, in April 2022. But now there's an even bigger problem for Putin, one deep below the waves. For all the issues with its surface fleet, Russia's current fleet of 58 submarines have been long considered among the most powerful in the world. This includes 11 nuclear-powered ballistic missile subs, 17 nuclear-powered attack subs, and 9 nuclear-powered cruise missile subs, with several more on the way next year. While they haven't been a factor in Ukraine, they are still considered a critical threat by the US military. However, their power may not last forever. Recent reports suggest that Russia's submarine capabilities are being seriously harmed by the backlash to its invasion, especially through the crippling effect of Western sanctions. So what does that mean for the future of the Russian military? And just how serious of a blow could it be to Putin's war machine? To understand just how critical Putin's submarine problem could be, we first need to take a quick look at some Russian naval history, which, funnily enough, is permeated with continuing and humiliating losses of fleets. But wait, there's a plot twist, and it occurs just after World War II. Russia has had military power at sea in one form or another since 1696, when Peter the Great first established the Imperial Russian Navy. Impressed by his visits to Western Europe, Peter realized that Russia could never be a true great power while remaining landlocked. By 1710, he had over 58 ships in his fleet, and despite some defeats, by Peter's death in 1725, Russia was the dominant sea power in the Baltic. During the reign of Catherine the Great, the empire's ambitions at sea had grown, establishing a new Black Sea fleet and annexing Crimea for the first time in 1783. By the time of her death in 1796, Russia possessed the world's largest navy after Britain. This period was the height of Russia's imperial naval power. As naval historian Robert A. Theobald once put it, to my mind, the death of Catherine marks the high watermark in Russian naval history. From this date to the end of the Imperial Navy, it was on a treadmill working hard, but getting nowhere. This became obvious during the Crimean War of 1853 to 1856, where Russia suffered a stinging defeat to the combined forces of the Ottomans, France, and Britain. The shortcomings of the Imperial Navy were even more obvious by the time of the 1904-1905 Russo-Japanese War. But it gets worse. In response to Russian expansionism in the Far East, the newly industrialized Japanese military gave Russian Tsar Nicholas II a humiliating defeat at sea. The war marked Japan's emergence as a great power and contributed heavily to the first Russian Revolution of 1905. Following the Second Revolution in 1917, what remained of the old Imperial Navy came under control of the Soviet Union. And while Lenin and Stalin both aimed to rebuild a powerful Soviet Navy, it remained largely inept throughout both world wars and into the early 1950s. As Theobald described it in his well-known 1953 presentation at the US Naval War College, this is the history of a navy which has lost more complete fleets than any other navy in the world. It is the history of a navy which has never been more than second rate, that has never been decisive in world history, and that has never developed a depth of tradition to compare with those of the Western navies. But this would change drastically only a few years after his assessment, mainly due to one factor, modern submarines. While Russia had some early submarines before World War II, the first modern Soviet ballistic missile submarines were completed in the late 1950s. These early Soviet models were diesel-electric and based on designs pioneered by the Germans, similar to the United States. However, by 1960, the Soviet Navy had launched its first nuclear-powered attack submarines, giving the USSR below-surface capabilities greater than perhaps any country except the US. Soon after, the Soviets also developed nuclear SSGN-class subs, running on nuclear power but designed to launch limited ballistic missile strikes against American aircraft carriers and other naval deployments. Over the next three decades, the Soviet Navy continued to build and maintain a large fleet of submarines, 
relying on them heavily to challenge America's greater military strength during the Cold War. Because the true names of Soviet subs were rarely known abroad, most are still referred to by NATO codenames, such as the Alpha-class nuclear subs. These use liquid metal-cooled reactor propulsion systems and titanium hulls, enabling them to move extremely fast, over 43 knots, or 80 kilometers an hour, at an operational depth of 2,000 feet, or 600 meters. Also important to Soviet deterrence and power projection were the Typhoon-class subs. The largest submarines ever built, Typhoons are over 563 feet, or 172 meters long, have a beam of 81 feet, or 25 meters, and can carry up to 20 Sturgeon nuclear-capable ballistic missiles. These were just a few of the many varieties of subs developed by the Soviet Navy, and the Soviets also continued heavily building diesel-electric models as well, such as the Kilo-class attack subs and others. The fleet was never able to make the switch to fully nuclear-powered, largely due to budgetary and technological constraints. However, by its peak in 1980, the USSR's submarine force had 480 boats, including 71 fast attack and 94 cruise and ballistic missile submarines. Even following the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, this submarine fleet remained a major part of Russia's naval power. Dmitry Gorenberg of the Center for Naval Analyses has noted that during the post-Cold War period, Putin has focused on developing new submarine capabilities, while Russia has essentially lost the ability to construct new, advanced surface vessels. The most advanced of these submarine developments are the Yasin and updated Yasin M-class SSGNs. Developed in the 1990s and early 2000s, Rand Corporation researcher Edward Geist has described these as the crown jewel of the contemporary Russian Navy and perhaps the pinnacle of present-day Russian military technology. And according to Admiral Fogo, one major advantage of the Yasin-class vessels is that they are very quiet, which is the most important thing in submarine warfare. They can also carry both Sircon hypersonic and long-range caliber cruise missiles. Yet these deadly subs also come with a hefty price tag. The Severa Davinsk, the first Yasin-class model, reportedly cost over $1.6 billion. While this is still much cheaper than the US's most advanced subs, it is a very high price tag considering Russia's far smaller economy. In the past few years, Putin's government has also claimed that even more nuclear subs are in the works, including what Russian state media claim to be a new division of submarines carrying nuclear-capable super torpedoes in the coming years. Nick Childs, senior fellow for naval forces and maritime security at the International Institute for Strategic Studies, has argued that investments in submarines up to this point are one of the only things which has allowed Russia to maintain its status among the leading powers. While its fleet is still far smaller than during the Soviet era, Childs points out that it remains very capable and along with some of the older submarines would still pose a threat to NATO, both at sea and against land-based targets. But even before the war in Ukraine, there were some doubts about the true effectiveness of Russia's impressive-seeming subs. While they are doubtless in better shape than its surface fleet, they have never been truly tested in combat. So how are Putin's submarine fleets faring in the Russo-Ukraine conflict? On land, the reckless nature of Russian military doctrine has been on full display in the invasion of Ukraine. But despite the enormous losses by Russia's ground forces, its navy has so far played a very limited role in the conflict. This includes its submarines, which have remained mostly as a nuclear deterrent and threat. The exception to this is Russia's Black Sea Fleet, where submarines off the coast of Sevastopol and Novorossiysk have been used to fire caliber missiles into Ukraine. None of these subs have so far been damaged or destroyed, and there are still concerns that they could be used to counter NATO activity and control trade routes in the Black Sea. But the consequences of Putin's invasion have created a different kind of problem for the Russian Navy and its submarines. The crushing regime of Western sanctions imposed on Russia has begun to erode the country's ability to resupply and maintain its military industry. And in December of 2022, the US State Department added even more sanctions directly targeting Russia's naval power. These have already begun to work, cutting Russia off from the technology required in modern subs. As Admiral Fogo told Newsweek in an interview, I think they have been severely crippled by these economic sanctions and by their own foolishness in the war in Ukraine. In particular, the maintenance of existing subs and development of new ones will become increasingly difficult since 
When they don't have the raw materials, they can't sustain the industrial base. They don't have the manpower, because that manpower is going into fighting the war in Ukraine. Military losses and brain drain make it likely that Russia will lose its ability to compete with Western countries in submarine development, especially when it comes to their ability to project power. Graham P. Hurd of the George C. Marshall European Center for Security Studies argues that the protracted nature of the conflict and the coming Ukrainian counteroffensive undercuts Russian military credibility. The repeated military failures in Ukraine have created growing pressure in Russia to project an image of strength through its submarines. In turn, this has incentivized the Russian Navy to take greater risks by using submarines which are not seaworthy and fast-tracking new weapon systems without proper testing. Heard added that submarines are the most expensive ticket item in Russia's military budget and have no obvious utility in this war, so Russia compensates and projects power through acceptance of greater risk. As a consequence, Russia's submarines will suffer indirect and long-term damage the longer the war lasts. Similarly, Heard and other experts have pointed out that the sanctions illustrate just how much of Russia's military-industrial complex was, and remains, reliant on critical Western technology. Without the advanced components for submarines manufactured in the US, UK, France, Germany and elsewhere, Russian development will be seriously stunted in the years to come. And there are almost no alternatives to the technology which sanctions have cut Russia off from. Parts from China and Iran, for example, are not advanced enough to meet Moscow's requirements. While experts remain divided on just how dependent Russia's nuclear submarines are on Western tech, it's pretty clear that at least some of the imported components are necessary to build new vessels. These are mostly thought to be technologically advanced electronic components for guidance, communication and missile deployment. Russian defense journalist Alexander Timokhin wrote in January that the sanctions imposed on Russia after the special military operation left a sharp imprint on the country's technological capabilities. The production of radar complexes, communication systems, guided missiles, sonar equipment, and other similar systems has proved to be difficult. As a consequence, these restrictions could make it nearly impossible to build Yasin and Yasin M-class subs and other highly capable boats. Childs from the International Institute for Strategic Studies points out that this trajectory is already visible, as while the newest Russian submarines are very capable, Russia's inefficient shipbuilding industry has struggled to deliver them on time and in significant numbers. Like other experts, he agrees that Russia's construction shortfalls will accelerate in the coming months and years, since this could well be exacerbated by the increased demands on other sectors of the defense industry as a result of the war, as well as from the impact of sanctions on certain key components. So what do these deficiencies mean for Putin's ambitions and the future of the Russian military? Well, experts have outlined two main possible scenarios for the future of Russia's submarine fleet. One possibility is that as military resource constraints continue to grow, it will lead to prioritization of the elements which have been most impacted, especially ground forces. As of May 2023, Russia has lost nearly 200,000 soldiers, a truly staggering figure for a modern military. In turn, as one analyst put it, that will inevitably lead to cuts, or limits at least, in shipbuilding in the future. The other possibility is that Russia will be forced to funnel more investment into submarines due to their relative importance and strategic value. This will mean less and less resources for replenishing ground troops and equipment, which are both cheaper and more expendable. But even if Putin opts for the second scenario, any money spent now is likely to have a delayed impact. Past investments in submarine development and maintenance will carry the Russian fleet for at least a few more years to come, but within five to ten years, it could be a very different picture. Just based on the size and current capabilities of Russian submarines, it will likely remain one of the world's most powerful fleets for the next decade. But after that, things are far more uncertain. Any modern submarine which breaks down in the years could become essentially useless, reduced to just so much expensive scrap metal. However Putin attempts to manage his growing economic constraints, the main role of Russian submarines will probably remain as a nuclear deterrent, and there are also some indications that Putin has already realized just how spread thin his resources really are. In March, Russia's Pacific fleet underwent a series of military drills which were described as a surprise inspection of more than a dozen submarines. 
potentially signaling a lack of faith by the Kremlin in the readiness or maintenance of the fleet. Readouts from the Kremlin show that Putin recently told Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu that while Russia's priorities remain the war in Ukraine, still, the objective to develop the Navy, including in the Pacific Theater of Operations, remains relevant. Adding that, it is clear that some of the fleet's assets can be used in conflicts elsewhere. This indicates both that Putin does not believe submarines can make much of a difference in Ukraine, and that they remain most useful as a nuclear deterrent, as Russia's submarines begin to break down in the coming years, with no easy way to maintain them or build new state-of-the-art models the country will also become less able to project power in this way. This will almost certainly happen, regardless of where the Kremlin prioritizes resources, especially since casualties in Ukraine show no sign of slowing down. As losses climb higher and higher, and as sanctions continue their squeeze, it may also provoke Putin into even more aggressive and reckless strategies. In fact, there is evidence that this is already taking place. In the past few months, Russia has deployed submarines in increasingly threatening positions. As Michael Peterson, the director of the Russia Maritime Studies Institute, told Newsweek, we have indications that nuclear-powered submarines have been deploying off the coast of the United States and into the Mediterranean and elsewhere along Europe periphery, in ways that mirror Soviet-style submarine deployments in the Cold War. Such aggressive posturing is likely tied to Putin's growing issues in an attempt to project a facade of Russia as a true global power, despite an economy less than half the size of California. This weakness is also reflected in overly optimistic predictions for its military-industrial complex. A recent analysis by the Institute for the Study of War (ISW) concluded, similarly to other experts, that Russian officials continue to claim that Russian defense manufacturers are increasing production amidst ongoing indications that the Russian Defense Industrial Base DIB, is unable to meet Russia's long-term economic and military goals. There have been rosy claims by officials like Alexei Rachmanov, head of the Russian United Shipbuilding Company, that submarine production time will soon be cut by 8 to 13 months. But there is little evidence to support this, and in another sign of growing weakness, Putin signed a decree on February the 27th, reducing previous plans to construct at least three nuclear reactor-equipped LIDAR-class icebreakers by 2035 down to just a single vessel. Again, this likely reflects the fact that the need to replenish the stocks of conventional ground weaponry lost in Ukraine will likely consume the majority of Russia's DIB and limit Russia's ability to produce systems aimed at longer-term strategic goals. This includes both nuclear icebreakers and submarines, indicating that Russia's resources are spread much thinner than Putin would like the world to believe. So, to sum up, despite the claims by the Kremlin, there are strong signs that Russia's disastrous strategy in Ukraine has backfired even more than we know. The squeeze of Western sanctions now threatens to render even the deadly Russian submarine fleet obsolete. The longer the war goes on and the more isolated Russia becomes, the harder it will be to obtain the advanced components needed for these vessels. This will continue to erode the country's industrial base, possibly crippling all long-term defense production. And because Russian losses in Ukraine are so heavy, Putin also faces a crisis of credibility and growing pressure to project a facade of power. This has already led to reckless, aggressive posturing by Russian subs and a willingness to use vessels which are not even seaworthy, a problem which seems likely to increase because the Russian Navy has historically been so reliant on them to project power, there is little question that the stagnation of its submarine fleet will be a serious blow in the coming years. But what do you think? Will sanctions and battlefield losses eventually doom Russia's submarine fleet? Or can Putin find a way around these issues and keep Russia as a great power? Let us know what you think in the comments section below. And don't forget to subscribe for more military content and analysis. This is the biggest country on planet Earth, with a total area of 6,601,665 square miles and a land area of 6,322,142 square miles. It represents 11% of the total world's land mass and is 1.8 times larger than America. But Russia isn't just a big country, it's a big problem. And if it collapses as a result of the consequences of the war in Ukraine, this will impact everybody, everywhere. Yes, even you. But why? And in what way? Let's find out. Send in the tanks, uh, if you can find any.
Russia has always prided itself on its Victory Day celebration, held to commemorate the Soviet victory over the Nazis in World War II. The bombastic parade held annually in Red Square has historically served as a visual barometer of Russian military power. It is common to see rows upon rows of marching soldiers, jets, tanks, armored vehicles, and intercontinental ballistic missiles file past an absorbed crowd and its approving leadership. This year, things were a little different. The Kremlin scaled things back, like a lot. There was no flyover, there were no Iskanders, there were 3,000 fewer soldiers, most of them cadets and students at local military universities. And rather than a steady stream of T-90Ms, T-14 Armatas, a solitary World War II vintage T-34 tank motored past the reviewing stand. For how staggering Russian tank losses have been in the Ukraine thus far, it's tempting to think this T-34 is actually the bottom of the barrel for Putin's forces. After all, having lost 192 tanks in the First Chechen War, 23 tanks in the Second Chechen War, and 3 tanks in the Russo-Georgian War, Russia has now lost an impressive 1,937 tanks in Ukraine thus far as of May 2023. And that is just how many have been visually confirmed. Just let that sink in. There are more tanks yet in Russia's arsenal, but most of them are currently employed in Ukraine, along with the lion's share of its military forces, explaining the humbler military parade presence than years past. Factor in the recent drone scare over the Kremlin, and we can see that this year's parade was held despite legitimate strategic red flags and security concerns unfathomable just one year ago. Some say the event, designed to capture the public's imagination and promote the heady militaristic nationalism of the Soviet glory days, is merely papering over the cracks in Russia's armed forces. Of these, there are many. The irony is that the last time the Russian military orchestrated a military victory of any consequence was exactly 78 years ago during World War II. Today, its operations in Ukraine are on track to follow a more common Russian pattern of strategic overstretch and ignominious withdrawal. There are increasing warning signs that the weaknesses we are seeing are evidence of far graver threats to Putin's regime. Recently, Yevgeny Prigozhin, chief of the Wagner mercenary group fighting around Bakhmut in Ukraine, criticized the Kremlin for not sending enough ammunition to make a difference on the front lines. Victory Day is the victory of our grandfathers, he vented on social media. We haven't earned that victory one millimeter. It should surprise no one that victory now looks far from attainable. On the contrary, in the light of economic sanctions and the declining financial health of the Russian Federation, some are predicting far worse for Putin's forces and his political future. With less to be positive about now than at any point in the war, could Putin's regime actually be on the brink of collapse? And what might that look like? In a recent survey of 167 foreign policy experts held by the Atlantic Council, 46% of them believed that the collapse or disintegration of Russia could happen in the next 10 years. 40% claimed that this would happen internally for a number of reasons, particularly because of a revolution, civil war, or political disintegration. We all know that wars gone awry can exacerbate and expedite the deterioration of a society faster than just about anything else. But Putin's abysmal strategic direction of Russia's war in Ukraine could have the country on the fast track to obscurity, oblivion, or far, far worse, outright dissolution. There are two prime historical touchpoints in modern history we tend to reference when we talk about a Russian political collapse, which is really saying something if you think about it. The first is the most recent, when the Soviet Union broke apart at the end of the Cold War. In case you're too young to remember, this collapse caught the world by surprise. Many were shocked to see a country so large and powerful, on paper at least, suddenly and rapidly fall apart. Some blame Russia's current state of affairs on the West's response to that significant geopolitical moment. Heralded as the start of a new era of freedom, liberation and self-determination, many worried the independence of a host of ex-Soviet satellites and the weakening of Russia would destabilize the international order. Since the 1990s, all of the Soviet Union's 21 constituent republics declared themselves sovereign. Putin, a staunch imperialist who pines for the good old days, took this pretty hard. After he rose to power, the West tried to maintain dialogue and positive relations with the Kremlin, even as it embarked on a repressive imperialist foreign policy with deployments in the Second Chechen War, the 2008 invasion of Georgia, and the 2014 invasion of Ukraine. 
Since the end of the Cold War, Putin has created a regime that actively restricts the rights of the dozens of different national and ethnic groups within the boundaries of the modern Russian state. He wants to be a Tsar, with a wheel of dependent satellites to exploit for natural resources, manpower and money. Russian officials and Kremlin propagandists have made it their goal to promote this agenda, making the ruthless look benign. Someday, who is to say Moldova, Kazakhstan or other Central Asian nations might not come under the tighter thumb of Russian imperial aggression? What would it mean for European security? That's why Ukraine matters. The war there poses serious problems for Putin's imperial ambitions. He and his cabinet thought it would be a short war, one that would permanently bring Ukraine back into Russia's orbit. Instead, he is suffering one of the most catastrophic military setbacks of the past hundred years, one that has already surpassed the devastation caused by the Russo-Japanese War of 1905, and one approaching the scale with the type of suffering that preceded the other major Russian collapse, the collapse of the Tsarist Empire in 1917. That, in case you forgot, was the first time the Russian Federation dissolved, the event that triggered Russia's chaotic, bloody descent into Soviet-era communism. And let me tell you, it was a whirlwind of a time to be alive. One moment you are a Russian soldier, fighting Germany and Austro-Hungary with the Entente Allies on the Eastern Front. The next, you learn the inefficient and widely corrupt Tsarist government can no longer sustain the economic and material costs of the war effort. Before you know it, tens of thousands of soldiers, workers and peasants are fed up, rising up, overthrowing the imperial government and installing the Bolsheviks in power. Countless Russian minorities yearned in those turbulent times for some form of recognition and freedom, which had been elusive under the Tsars. When the empire disintegrated and crashed out of the war, social, economic and socio-political ruptures terminated the central control of the state and enabled the temporary formation of a series of new polities including the Siberian Republic and other former territories that got their first taste of independence. These include Finland, Poland, Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia. It wouldn't be long before the Soviets, consolidating state power once more under the communist flag of the USSR, gobbled them back up. And you wonder why they were more than happy to join NATO in the aftermath of the Cold War. Most experts believe that a modern Russian collapse will be swifter, more brutal, and more akin to the revolutionary crisis of 1917 than the Soviet collapse of 1991. It is a possible scenario. The conditions in Russia today do bear a passing resemblance to those within the Tsarist Empire at the time of its fall. A deeply corrupt and morally bankrupt ruling class led by oligarchs, aristocrats, and elites with no conception of the economic suffering of the masses. Ethnic minorities in places like Dagestan, Ichkeria, Igushetia, Ossetia, Kabardino, the Caucasus, Tuva, Buryatia, and others inhumanely treated, discriminated against, and used as cannon fodder in Putin's wars. A population in serious demographic decline, growing mistrust of Russian institutions and governance, intensive state oppression, a country that will owe billions, if not trillions of dollars, to rebuild Ukraine when the time comes. If you think any singular cause will cause Putin's downfall, you'd be wrong. History is non-linear, multi-causal and contingent. Yanis Bagashki, author of Failed State, A Guide to Russia's Rupture, put it best. The demise of the current Russian Federation is unlikely to follow a single path, unlike that of the Soviet Union where 15 Union Republics became independent states almost by default. The fracturing of the state is likely to be chaotic, prolonged, sequential, conflictive and increasingly violent. It can result in the full separation of some federal units and the amalgamation of others into new federal or confederal arrangements. Bruno Tertrace, an advisor for geopolitics at the Institute Montaigne, has argued that the only good thing about a Russian collapse today is that the nuclear issue would be far less serious than it was with the Soviet Union. Elites would be far more interested in preserving some semblance of authority and power rather than commit political and personal suicide by launching a nuclear attack. Most of Russia's nuclear forces today are inside the Federation, not beyond its borders like during the Cold War, when it had 7,000 nukes stationed outside Russia. Exploring the implications for Russia's future as a nuclear power if trends continue the way they are, Bruno observed, in the 1970s the Soviet Union was described as upper volta with rockets, he said. By the 2000s it was Mexico with nuclear weapons. In 2010s, a gas station with nuclear weapons. 
Will it become a Somalia with nuclear weapons? So how exactly might Russia collapse? What would it mean for its neighbors? We know that a country's foreign policy is a reflection of its domestic situation, and vice versa. In Russia's case, Putin's actions have the country on the path to economic Armageddon. The price of Russian crude oil is the lowest it's been in years. Within the first two months of 2023, the state had already fallen into a deficit level normally achieved in an entire year. It isn't profiting much from its sale of hydrocarbons to India and China. Its import sales are collapsing. Its GDP has shrunk by 4%. Air cargo fell by 60% in 2022. There has been a massive loss of technical expertise and specialized equipment as foreign corporations and businesses fled the country. It lacks vital semiconductors and other specialized machinery imported from the West, meaning its entire economy, to say nothing of its military power, is becoming more and more primitive. The net result is an increasing reliance on states like China for resources and technology, systems that can be integrated but take time. While that happens, poverty will spread, it will be harder to receive good health care, and the population will grow more discontent with the government. These factors could affect the strength of existing national movements or ethnic minorities within the Russian Federation seeking greater independence and autonomy. Moscow is far removed from many of these population centers and has, until now, relied on a technocratic system of oligarchical control where Kremlin-appointed elites receive massive checks to keep their provinces in line. These leaders, in turn, return the regional profits to the Kremlin's coffers. Russian elites are deeply dependent on Moscow's political and economic authority for their own legitimacy. When this goes bankrupt, what happens? When the public loses faith in these Kremlin-appointed governors and the Kremlin can no longer provide them with the support they need to maintain order, there's a chance that local separatist movements will grow. In resource and industrial-rich regions, there might be the temptation to cut ties with Moscow and go it alone with the support of the people. This happened in 2020, when mass protests erupted in eastern Khabarovsk after the arrest and 22-year imprisonment of Sergei Fergal, a member of the opposition party. This caused a power vacuum that Moscow had to fill. But it needs resources and support to do so. And with the war dragging on and the bite of sanctions becoming more and more acute, it is increasingly likely that Putin will struggle to plug the holes in the dike as the flood of discontent spreads. Unlike the Soviet Union, whose power rested on the Comintern and whose governing authority always had a reasonably clear line of succession, nobody knows what will happen in Putin's vertical, highly centralized hierarchy if the figurehead falls. Will there be a civil war? Will a power struggle ensue between Putin's elites? Will Moscow, already neck deep in its military invasion of Ukraine, have the resources to suppress any separatist movements that arise? Back in 1917, this was the avenue that led to the downfall of the Tsarist Empire. Like falling dominoes, the Ukrainian Central Rada presented its first universal declaration. Five months later, it declared the creation of the Ukrainian People's Republic. Other regions did the same. By the time you get to 1918, the Red Army was forced to suppress these movements and bring them into submission. Only Poland, Finland, Latvia, Estonia and Lithuania States with active support from the United States, Great Britain and France, the victors of World War I, managed to secure their independence, if only for a time. The Bolsheviks managed to set the ship straight, but it came at a massive cost. Putin has to hope his cronies are as committed as the Bolsheviks were when his grasp on power is brought into question. So far, one of his tactics has been to feature minority participants in the Ukraine occupation like Kadyrov's Chechens in his propaganda campaign for two purposes to both show Federation solidarity in the war and, if things go sour, to have a scapegoat for the Russian army's broader operational failures. If Russia collapsed, it would probably start with a breakaway movement in one territory that spreads like a virus to others on the country's periphery. Chechnya, for example, could be the first domino to fall. They have a history of enmity with the Kremlin, after all, and a recent one at that. Local elites like Kadyrov will be posturing for greater political power if they start to glimpse fractures in Putin's existing political system. Already struggling to deal with Ukraine, how might Russia deal with discontented Chechen and Wagner mercenaries who, more loyal to the cult of their own determined rulers than they are to Russia itself, come marching back to Moscow? Could these leaders, fueled by vengeful hatred for the way they were left to die on the battlefields of Ukraine with too few weapons, shells, and dilapidated equipment, 
form a Faustian pact and team up against Putin? Or will battlefield defeat and economic poverty force these sides into internecine warfare amongst themselves, a battle royale for ultimate political power? OK, it might be a stretch, and we should temper our prognosis just a little. While it's tempting to look at online maps depicting the collapse of Russia by 2025, with fantastical graphics carving the country up into dozens of independent republics, the reality is that Russia's internal divisions are far less stark than they appear. According to Alexei Gusev, a fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, the maps betray a delusion on the part of their authors that is common to many political forecasters. These observers, all map fetishists, mistake the administrative boundaries of Russia's provinces for real borders of socio-economic life, unaware that the true divisions in Russian society almost never coincide with the arbitrary lines drawn by Communist Party functionaries in the first half of the last century. Russia is extremely unlikely to disintegrate along its regional borders for geographical, sociological, economical and political administrative reasons. Sociologically, Gusev argues, most of Russia's regions share the same basic values and attitudes. For those praying for Putin's downfall, just know this. Russia always ends up rebuilding itself. Preferentially, a new, more egalitarian form of governance would emerge from the ashes. Historically, hardship, defeat and political turmoil have been the breadbasket of totalitarianism. As long as Putin remains in power, it is unlikely that Russia's collapse will resemble the peaceful disintegration of 1991. Putin looks set to run, in air quotes, naturally for president again in 2024. He'll be familiar with essays by the likes of Ival Ilyin, who wrote in 1950 what dismemberment of Russia entails for the world. He knows that battlefield victories will all but seal his grip on power for decades to come. But with a hard year of campaigning ahead, one in which Ukraine will slowly integrate new Western weapon systems into its counteroffensive strategy, Putin will be forced to drain Russian resources further, sending young men to die on the front lines. Hatred will grow. Putin will be forced to suppress these feelings to prevent widespread discontent. This begins a vicious cycle in which the only thing that can save his dictatorship is more suppression, which leads to more discontent. And you see where this is going. Edward Lucas, senior advisor and senior fellow at the Center for European Policy Analysis, put it best. As the butcher's bill mounts in Ukraine, the war story contains only stale bombast. The lie machine insists that black is white. The result is cognitive dissonance between what Russians experience in their daily lives and what the state propaganda machine is telling them. As we know from Soviet times, that can last for a long time, but not indefinitely. The whiff of change is in the air. The truth, more than anything, is that the cracks in the Russian power pyramid have been present since Putin came to power. His actions over the past year have only accelerated a process of decline already long in motion. It is fighting an unwinnable war. If it refuses to pull out of Ukraine and rebuild its military, it will soon be unable to prevent those who want to leave the Federation from doing so. If the oligarchs turn on Putin, Will there be a struggle between intelligence services, the National Guard and foreign mercenaries? Will Putin be assassinated? Russia has committed several grave geopolitical blunders throughout the past hundred years. Could this be their worst? Could Putin survive politically or physically a military defeat? Let us know in the comments. You may have heard of Meals on Wheels, but have you ever wondered about the naval military equivalent? The United States Navy has officially taken mobile mealtime to the next level. Every day that an American nuclear-powered aircraft carrier spends at sea, it has to provide three square meals for the 5,000 hungry sailors who call the ship home. The resulting process is a mind-boggling marvel of culinary engineering. If you're doing the math, I'll spare you the mental gymnastics. That's over 17,000 meals, seven days a week, 365 days a year. How, you ask, is this even possible? Let's find out. They say the way to someone's heart is through their stomach. This certainly applies to hungry American sailors of the US Navy. Aboard the most common aircraft carrier in the Navy fleet, the 100,000-ton Nimitz-class vessel, an average crew complement of between 5,000 and 6,000 sailors will spend months on deployment working, sleeping, and eating aboard their city at sea. Whether you're busy scrubbing the flight deck, flying an F-A-18F Super Hornet, maintaining the nuclear reactor, or overseeing the arresting gear operation, the alimentary needs of this crew are truly staggering. 
feeding thousands of people in a relatively cramped space requires a Herculean logistical effort. On any given day, a carrier's crew can consume more than 1,600 pounds of chicken, 160 gallons of milk, 30 cases of cereal, and 350 pounds of lettuce, noted Chief Petty Officer Naomi Goodwin, herself responsible for preparing officers' meals aboard an aircraft carrier. Because carriers can spend months at sea, they often deplete their perishable items like fruits and vegetables before the deployment is complete. To compensate, they stock up with as much perishable food as possible at the beginning of a deployment. Once the fresh food disappears, canned or dried goods can only get you so far. To maintain morale as stocks dwindle, a carrier's supply crew is regularly in contact with wholesale distributors who work to replenish stocks whenever a carrier comes near a port. When US Navy warships have to resupply at sea, they use a process called underway replenishment. Getting the food aboard is probably the hardest part. The alongside connective replenishment method is the most common form of underway replenishment. When a supply vessel pulls up to the carrier, it must match its speed on a parallel trajectory, a daunting task in rough seas and choppy winds. Once in place, the two ships are connected by a hotline, followed by a much heavier duty messenger line, which facilitates the transfer of heavy pallets loaded with food, mail, fuel, and other supplies. Coasting across the open watery chasm separating the two vessels, the carrier's crew pulls in heavy palletized cargo and begins storing boxes of pineapples, tomatoes, apples, onions, potatoes, and more in one of the carrier's fluorescent lit refrigeration and dry storage units. Replete with hanging ethylene filters that preserve products over longer periods by trapping gases that cause ripening, refrigeration units are traditionally located in a centralized area several decks beneath the galley. Vertically stacking galleys and storage areas was a deliberate design choice, giving cooks easy access to the ingredients they need at mealtime using hydraulic lifts and elevators. Resupply occurs every week or so, adding between 400,000 and 1 million pounds of food to the carrier's stocks. If necessary, supplies can also be delivered vertically via helicopter or light aircraft when the situation arises. The five galleys aboard the Nimitz commissioned in 1975 differ from their more modern counterpart, the USS Ford Supercarrier, commissioned in 2017. While the ships have the same footprint, one journalist observed, space all over the Ford has been reimagined to make carrier life and work better and more efficient. Rather than five galleys, the Ford has two, one centralized in the aft section of the ship, the other forward to serve the carrier's air wing. All right, so far so good. No one's going hungry anytime soon. But what about drinking water? You need a lot of it to hydrate thousands of sailors in what is often a hot and humid work environment. Luckily, modern aircraft carriers have world-class desalination facilities on board. These portable water plants work almost like a distillery. Water is superheated to steam, then condensed using cooled pipes. Minerals are added as the water is filtered for drinking and general use. All this is powered using the ship's nuclear reactor, which itself only has to be refueled every 25 years pretty amazing stuff. While we're on the topic of facilities, wondering what kind of monster kitchen you'd need to service all these sailors, here's the thing. It's not about size, it's about efficiency. A carrier's cooking facilities have been well designed to cater to the masses. They have to be. A carrier is designed for efficiency. Below deck, snaking maze-like corridors and tiny rooms take advantage of every inch of available space. Kitchens are cramped, filled to the brim with the latest industrial cooking machinery, huge stoves that make the temperature soar in that confined interior space, automated self-cleaning convection ovens that can cook any kind of meat in a variety of ways, commercial-grade mixing bowls, rows upon rows of warming trays, soup vats, tilt skillets, deep fryers, broilers, commercial toasters, microwaves, food storage containers, drying racks, busing carts, food processors, prep tables, blenders, and more. All this equipment enables culinary specialists to cook huge batches of food for the sailors aboard. What does it all cost to feed a crew this size? Well, grab your wallet because it'll cost a pretty penny. Senior Chief Francis Patel, a culinary specialist aboard the George H.W. Bush, estimated that the Navy spends somewhere between $45,000 to $65,000 a day on food at sea. That's $1.8 million a month. It's pretty good bang for your buck considering what you get. 16 to 18,000 meals a day, from 6 a.m. breakfasts through to the aptly named mid-rats or midnight rations. But how do the meals actually get prepared? Teams of chefs, known as culinary specialists, form the dream team aboard the carrier. 
There are around 93 culinary specialists in all who follow a strict 15-day menu cycle to simplify the meal selection process. The regimented cooking process has been optimized for mass production. Cooks spend hours bulk prepping huge batches of food, a constant responsibility that can be monotonous at times. To add variety to their own schedules, junior cooks are trained on different tasks to make them more versatile in the galley. It is hard work, sometimes at strange hours. The breakfast shift can wake up as early as 3 a.m. to have enough time to prepare enough pancake batter, sausages, oatmeal, eggs, and bacon to go round. Cooks tend to work 12 to 16 hour shifts that involve prep work, serving, and cleaning. Punctuality and quality are key. Culinary specialists are held to high standards, the same as those they serve on a daily basis. Special meals punctuate an otherwise routine menu offering. Anything from Taco Tuesday to a Mongolian grill and a special birthday meal each calendar month that can include a tablecloth, wine glasses, nice music, and a main course of prime rib or lobster are sure morale boosters. On most naval vessels, officers eat in their own mess, known as a wardroom, smaller and more refined than the canteen area. An officer's mess boasts padded chairs, tablecloths, and glasses of coke garnished with slices of lemon. In the wardroom, cooks stick to the same menu cycle as their counterparts in the general mess, but smaller amounts of people to feed, in the hundreds rather than the thousands, means they can take time to cook and present the food a bit more luxuriously. The wardroom, of course, still isn't the finest dining establishment aboard ship. That is reserved for the captain's cabin, a modest-sized room with hints of the old-fashioned ocean liner about it, where a personal chef diverges from the standard menu, preparing fresh meals for the captain and their guests from whatever ingredients they can find on the ship. Yes, sailors on deployment tend to eat far better than their land-based counterparts in the field. Nobody eats MREs at sea. Underway replenishment adds freshness to shipboard food, even if it is prepared on an industrial scale. One of the favorite meals at sea is chicken wings, but to serve it, culinary specialists must prepare 1,600 kilograms of chicken each time, a number that reinforces the logistical scale of this insane feeding operation. To bring in that home-cooked taste, bakers make use of massive 60-pound dough mixers to make their own bread, rolls, cookies, and other baked goods. Cooking meals from scratch, sometimes in the view of the serving area, communicates how much the Navy values its service members. Veterans often complain that naval chow served in decades past was subpar and inedible. Today, that's no longer the case. It may not be your mother's cooking, but daily meals are meticulously planned and served to be as calorically dense and nutrient-rich as possible. They have to be to fortify sailors working hard on their feet, day in, day out. A look into a daily shift for a culinary specialist reveals how much effort is required to cook for an entire carrier crew. At mealtime, broad, heated grills are prepared and manned by young cooks who have the raw food at hand. If, say, a cook is serving lamb, he arranges lamb chop after lamb chop in neat rows until the entire surface is covered with meat, 150 chops at least. By the time the last one is in place, it's time to return to the beginning and flip the meat over to cook on the other side. If the chefs are cooking roast beef, they will slice roughly 600 pounds of meat per meal. Dinner is perhaps the busiest meal of the day. By evening, the main eating bay becomes crowded. Serving lines quickly materialize as sailors find their way to the commissary for some hot chow. Each grabs a plate, utensils, a cup, and napkins, cleaned during downtime by members of the culinary specialist crew, and begins indicating what they'd like served. Back in 2011, a journalist for the National News observed this process firsthand. Mashed potato and steak with gravy is proving to be a popular choice, but there's also barbecue chicken, stir-fry, pasta, and chicken with tomato sauce on offer. Three young sailors, Jennifer Penner, Elvin Carmona Rivera, and Sarah Strong, are lingering in the cafeteria area, having just finished their meals. They say that while the food on board is perfectly fine, the special fried rice is a particular favorite. They do crave homemade rather than mass-produced meals. I look forward to eating something that's cooked from scratch, just for me, says Strong. This is okay, but you can tell it's been prepared for hundreds of people. Where the general mess doesn't satisfy a sailor's specific cravings, they can browse a small grocery store where different amenities like hygiene goods, razors, junk food, drinks are available to keep morale high at all times. Carrier grocery stores can make $10,000 a day, showing just how vital they are to the ship's daily operations. Even if it isn't the freshest or most gourmet offering, the fact that the Navy can provide hot chow thousands of miles from land in any condition is nothing short of a modern marvel.
It is true that by the time naval sailors reach land once more, they are eager for fresh-cooked food they might once have taken for granted. Wood-fired pizza, mum's home-cooked lasagna, freshly squeezed orange juice, and more are the tantalizing rewards of a deployment well done. This doesn't detract from the impressive service on display in the galleys and storerooms of America's aircraft carriers. The science and logistics behind the process of cooking at sea is truly impressive. Spending seven to ten months at a time at sea, cooking crews ensure that good food is prepared and delivered in spades, on time, every day. Have you ever tried Navy chow aboard an aircraft carrier or experienced anything like the Navy's feeding operation? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. With the amount of lethal aid that the US is delivering to Ukraine to help defend themselves against the ongoing Russian invasion, it's logical to ask, could the US conquer Russia on its own? To answer that, we need to take a closer look at both countries' militaries, compare their strengths and weaknesses, and get clear on who is the bravest and the baddest armed force out there. Starting off with a deep dive, let's talk about nuclear power. Here's the thing. We need to accept that comparing US and Russian military power will have to exclude the use of nuclear weapons by either side. Why? Well, the US and Russia have roughly equal parity in nuclear warheads, with reportedly 5,900 total operational nuclear warheads for Russia and 5,400 for the US. Included in these stockpiles, yep, it's a tie. Russia and the US each have about 1,600 active, deployed, strategic nuclear warheads. However, these numbers are just best guesses, since neither country will confirm nor deny their active nuclear forces, and only rarely will they confirm where such weapons are being kept. It's scary to be kept in the dark on this topic, right? Well, it gets scarier. Apparently, Russia claims to have a working dead hand system in place, also known as the perimeter system, that will automatically launch Russia's nuclear forces if an attempted first strike is launched to decapitate Russian leadership. While this system is supposed to be offline under normal circumstances, it's not clear when Russia has this system set to on. It's quite likely that since 2014, during Russia's earlier invasion of eastern Ukraine and the Crimean Peninsula, this system may have been continually online, in order to prevent a decapitating first strike by US forces. It gets worse. Putin apparently placed Russia's entire nuclear forces on high alert in February of 2022, following the invasion of Ukraine and NATO and the West's response to support the defenders. There is no indication that the high alert status has been revoked. In fact, as of March 29, 2023, President Putin has announced that Russia will no longer give advanced warning of their nuclear weapons tests, following their February announcement that they would no longer allow the US to inspect their nuclear weapons sites as part of the decades-old START weapons treaty. With all these unsettling red flags in place, let's shift gears and take a look at other aspects of the US and Russian militaries. Who do you think has the best army, budget, and weaponry? The short answer is, there really is no comparison. The US military is currently vastly superior to anything Russia can muster. Everything we've seen from the invasion of Ukraine so far shows that the Russian army, navy, and air force have been completely overrated by Western analysts and have been manhandled expertly by Ukraine's outnumbered but valiant defenders. What's left of Russia's once vaunted military is being chewed up faster than they can replace them. But it wasn't always this way. During the Cold War, the Soviet Union and the US had roughly equal conventional forces, at least in numbers. The USSR had an advantage in raw numbers of tanks and artillery, especially in the areas bordering Western Europe and its NATO member countries while the US had a larger and more advanced Air Force, Navy, and Special Forces. But since the breakup of the Soviet Union in 1991, the two sides have grown steadily and dramatically apart. In terms of the sophistication of their tanks and aircraft, the reliability of their state-of-the-art weapon systems, and their respective capability to project power into other regions and spheres of influence. For example, Russia currently has only one working aircraft carrier an older, fuel-oil-burning ship launched in 1985 named the Admiral Kuznetsov, which, oddly enough, was built in Ukraine. This ship has suffered a string of serious accidents, from shipboard fires to repair cranes falling on its flight deck during repairs. When it does travel, it never sails far from its home port without a seagoing tug to tow it back home. It isn't even in current deployment, having been in different dry docks undergoing continual repairs since 2018, and it's known to leave an incredibly dark trail of dense smoke due to an inability for its boilers to fully burn its low-grade fuel. 
The whole ship is an embarrassment to the world's navies, yet it's the largest capital ship Russia still has afloat, so they'll do anything to try and keep it going. You might see it back on the high seas in 2024, maybe. In comparison, the United States is completing its second carrier in the Ford class, the most advanced and largest aircraft carrier class in the world. The US Navy currently operates 11 carrier strike groups, each of which is built around a nuclear-powered carrier. Each of these strike groups incorporates multiple ships that includes Aegis-class carriers, nuclear-powered attack submarines, destroyers, minesweepers, and additional support and resupply ships. Each Ford-class carrier will be able to support more than 75 aircraft, including the latest fifth-generation aircraft, the F-35C, along with state-of-the-art drones, airborne warning, and surveillance aircraft. These carrier strike groups allow the US to patrol the world's oceans and project air power far from the US mainland. Russia has no equivalent capability, and likely never will. The same inequality exists in their respective air forces, and it's only widening. While the US has both the F-35 and F-22 fifth-generation stealth fighters, Russia's only close to but not quite fifth-gen fighter, the Su-57, can't deploy over Ukraine for fear of being shot down. Meanwhile, the US is already making progress on the NGAD, the next-generation air dominance system, which includes new weapons, advanced sensors, networking and battle management suites, redesigned jet engines and innovative combat drones that will be designed around a truly groundbreaking 6th-gen fighter to replace the F-22, which, even though it's being replaced, still remains the best dogfighting combat aircraft in operation. The US Navy is also working on a 6th-gen carrier-based stealth fighter under the current program name FAXX. Prototypes may already be flying, and the current Navy budget has already earmarked over $9 billion in funding for further development. On the other side of the equation, Russia claims to be working on a 5th-gen++ fighter, the Mikoyan Pak-DP, also known as the MiG-41. But so far, it barely exists in reduced-sized wind tunnel mock-ups, and may not be seen as a flying prototype until sometime in the mid-2030s. Then, there are the respective tank forces. The US Abrams tank may not be the world's best. Some argue that spot is taken up by the Israeli Makava, the German Leopard 2, or the British Challenger 2. But the Abrams has been battle-tested since the first Gulf War in 1990, and has been continually upgraded and improved. Currently, the Abrams M1A2 System Enhancement Package version 4, SEP version 4, will employ third-generation, three-gen FLIR, forward-looking infrared advanced optics that allow tank commanders to identify and attack targets farther away than ever before. Of course, Russian fanboys will point to the much-vaunted T-14 Armata as the best tank in the world. Except, well, where to begin? The tank was designed around the A85-3 engine, a copy of an X-shaped German engine which was never designed for tank propulsion. The tank's electronics and computer controls suffer from a lack of advanced computer chips, which under Western sanctions has been a real Achilles heel for the Russian economy. Captured Russian drones show they are so desperate for computer chips that they've resorted to using stolen Swedish traffic cameras for their guts. Without a consistent supply of computer chips, there's no way Russia can mass-produce the Armata. That wasn't bad enough, the production company for the Armata, UVZ, is busy upgrading previously mothballed T-62s and supporting the overworked T-72B3 and T-90M assembly lines. Currently, any Armatas being assembled are being done by hand. By hand. That may work for limited production Rolls Royces and Lamborghinis, but it doesn't bode well for the implementation of a mass-produced battlefield weapons platform. Without any Armatas in Ukraine, and with a greater reliance on more outdated and poorly retrofitted Soviet-era models, the Abrams is far and away better than the vast majority of the surviving Russian tank forces. I say surviving because as of March 2023, the Russians have lost, at a bare minimum, an astounding 1,900 main battle tanks. Everything from the upgraded but still outdated T-72s to around 58 of their more modern T-90s. This means that more than half of their country's entire pre-invasion active tank force has been destroyed or captured. And this number is only what's been positively verified by Western observers like the Oryx team of open-source analysts. According to the London-based International Institute for Strategic Studies, the total could be anywhere from 20% to 40% higher. Russia is so desperate for replacement tanks that they're even bringing in not just the T-62s from their mothballed tank graveyards, but as of March 23, 2023, 
even some 75-year-old T-54s and 55s. That would be like the US bringing back its Korean War-era M47 and M48 patterns. The bad news doesn't stop there. Russia has also lost around 800 infantry fighting vehicles, lightly armored trucks and transports, 2,200 armored fighting vehicles like the various MBT, MBD, and BTR models, 230 mobile command posts and communication units, 300 engineering vehicles, 190 towed artillery pieces, 370 self-propelled artillery, 190 multiple rocket launchers, MLRS, 100 surface-to-air systems, 2,300 unarmored transports, jeeps, and other vehicles. Honestly, at this point, it's almost easier to count which tanks and vehicles Russia has left, rather than try to keep up with the ones they've lost. And again, all of this has happened not against NATO or the US directly, but against much smaller Ukraine, and in just over a year. The Russian Air Force, when it's deigned to make an appearance over the battlefield, has also suffered unusually high casualties. It's estimated that 6-8% to of its active tactical combat aircraft have been destroyed, including around 15% of its pre-invasion multi-role and ground attack aircraft, including the more advanced Su-30SM and Su-34. Douglas Barry, a military aviation analyst at the IISS, believes at least 20 Su-34 strike aircraft have been lost, along with one or two of their top-of-the-line Su-35s. And if you're still counting, you can tack on a minimum of 80 combat helicopters. Russia's navy isn't doing any better. In April of 2022, the flagship of the Black Sea Fleet, the cruiser Moskva, was sunk by Ukrainian drone attacks, though Russia at first claimed it was due to a fire started by careless smokers. Following that meme show, the frigate Admiral Makarov assumed the role of flagship of the Black Sea Fleet, but it was attacked less than a month later in May of 2022. It's not confirmed, but the Makarov might now be inoperable. All told, the Russian Navy has lost 18 ships of various sizes and has had to pull all of its ships of any value back from the Western Black Sea due to fears of more air and sea drone attacks. Not a very good showing against a country that officially has no navy. Then there's the overall troop losses. According to several estimates, Russia has lost as many as 200,000 to 270,000 troops, either killed, wounded or missing, or captured in the invasion of Ukraine. And with close to 2 million men of draftable age having left the country to avoid Putin's first conscription in 2022, those troops won't be easily replaced. Neither will the hundreds of trained pilots, nor the hundreds of highly trained elite paratroopers and special forces killed in the first days of the war in the failed attack on the Hostomel airport, and in the equally disastrous attempt to assassinate President Zelensky. And because the Russian army has never created an independent, think-for-yourself NCO cadre, and must be led by higher leaders who do all the thinking for the frontline troops, an astounding 14 generals have been confirmed to have died in the fighting. As of just May of 2022, Moscow had admitted that they had lost more than 300 high-ranking officers, a third of them members of the senior staff, namely colonels, lieutenant colonels, and majors. And this is only from a single year of combat against what is arguably a second-tier military, though Ukraine is punching way above its weight class. There are several reasons why Russia's military is doing so poorly. Institutional kleptocracy Somewhere between 30% and 40% of Russia's annual military budget is siphoned off by oligarchs, commanders, and even Putin himself, who has an estimated fortune of over $200 billion. You can't expect your tank's reactive armor to operate when someone claimed to buy the explosives but instead put egg carton cardboard into the pouches where the explosives are supposed to go. Outdated tactics With the serious degradation of its military both in numbers and quality, Russia has come to rely more and more on World War I tactics, namely massed artillery barrages and human wave attacks. The Russian commanders issue top-down commands that often bear little to no awareness of the current battlefield's logistics. This stems in part from Russia's incapability of creating an educated and well-trained NCO corps, which all other Western nations rely on. The inability to adjust. Russia seems incapable of learning from its mistakes. It's fought battles where its tanks bunched up and became easy targets for Ukrainian artillery, aided by spotter drones or simply rolled through minefields without any concern for the consequences. We'll discuss one such example later on, in the Battle of the Sevyevsky Donets. This rigidity is another result of a lack of a properly trained NCO corps who might be able to adjust avenues of attack 
and better coordinate tactics at the point of opposition. The only element of the Russian armed forces that Putin seems able to rely on is his nuclear arm. And as we've already agreed, we're not including these in our discussions, for now at least. But Putin continues to rattle his nuclear sabers every chance he gets, as if that's the only way he can keep NATO and the US from placing boots on the ground in Ukraine. But it's clear from the battlefield that Ukraine needs no additional troops, just the advanced weaponry and ammunition that is already flowing into the country as we speak. There are three recent battles that showcase Russia's surprising ineptitude in modern warfare. The Battle for Antonov Airport, February 24, 2022. Within hours of President Putin's announcement of his invasion of Ukraine, sorry, his special military operation, a coordinated effort was made to land paratroopers, known as the VDV, and other special forces at Kyiv's Antonov Airport, otherwise known as the Hostomel Airport, named for the city in which it's located. An estimated 30 to 40 Russian helicopters led the airborne invasion, supported by a handful of fighter aircraft. If it had been successful, this operation would have paved the way for dozens of large Il-76 troop transports to land. Those planes would have carried thousands of reinforcements and would have then occupied a vital region within 10 kilometers of Ukraine's capital. Instead, Ukrainian resistance met the first attackers and, after the initial surprise wore off and Ukrainian mechanized reinforcements arrived, they managed to encircle the airport and eliminate at least 200 of the VDV in just a few days. Meanwhile, Ukrainian artillery cratered the runway, rendering it useless for the planned follow-on landing of the Il-76 transports. The VDV troops held on for weeks, supported by a few tanks and other vehicles that had broken through Ukrainian resistance northwest of Kyiv and had managed to link up with the Russian forces around the airfield, some of which had scattered into the nearby towns of Irpin and Bucha. However, the main column of Russian tanks and reinforcements heading south from Belarus, numbering up to 15,000 troops, never made it to the airport and was stuck in a traffic jam more than 40 kilometers long. In this ill-conceived, poorly supported and mismanaged attack, Putin wasted the best of his elite paratroops, as well as his chance for a quick, decapitating strike on the Ukrainian capital. His miscalculations of the strength and coordination of Ukrainian resistance, combined with his overconfidence about his own military's performance, were merely previews of the disasters that would unfold during the rest of his invasion of Ukraine, the Battle of the Sovietsky Donets. The first year of the invasion of Ukraine has displayed time and again the lack of military coordination on the part of the Russian forces, as well as their inability to adapt to the changing military environment during the heat of battle. Time and again, Russian forces will encounter an ambush, a minefield, or simply a well-prepared defense, and rather than regroup and try a different avenue of attack, will simply plow mindlessly ahead, regardless of the losses. One such event that perfectly encapsulates all the problems Russia is having with modern warfare is the well-documented disaster known as the Battle of the Sovietsky Donets, which occurred the 5th through the 13th of May 2022. In an effort to force a crossing of the Donetsk River in northeastern Ukraine, a Russian battalion tactical group, BTG, numbering between 1,000 and 1,500 troops, supported by tanks, armored personnel carriers, APCs, and artillery, placed a group of pontoons across the river near the small city of Sivyeski. They began to send tanks and APCs to the western side, while calling up additional vehicles on the eastern side to prepare to have them cross as well. But Ukraine had advanced warning of this attack, possibly due to satellite surveillance supplied by the US. In preparation, the Ukrainian armed forces brought up both tanks and artillery, with spotter drones overhead. When around half of the vehicles had crossed, Ukrainian artillery began pounding the two pontoon bridges already in place. Isolating the forces that had already crossed, they also pounded the now massed vehicle pileup on the far side of the river, destroying a vast number of frontline combat vehicles. Rather than give up against a prepared and alert defensive formation, Russian commanders just continued to feed more forces into the cauldron. Some Russian military bloggers went beyond calling these decisions inept and suicidal and deemed them instead to be sabotage. When the surviving units finally pulled back the following week, Russia had lost over 70 tanks and other vehicles, and by some accounts more than 1,000 troops killed, wounded and missing. Retired British Major General Mick Ryan estimated that the defeat likely resulted in not just a BTG, but probably an entire brigade losing a large part of its combat power. While most Western militaries would see such a calamity as a reason to learn from such mistakes, the Russian command structure doesn't seem to know how to make adjustments. Additional major defeats where Russia seemed heedless of massive casualties 
occurred at regular intervals across the Ukrainian battlefield, including Kherson, Kharkiv, Zaporizhia, and Volodar, not to mention the estimated 30 to 50,000 casualties Russia may have suffered in their months-long struggle to capture the fortified region around Bakhmut. Many observers will say that the Russian-Ukrainian war might not be a fair comparison to a possible Russian-US military encounter. Isn't there some event that would provide a better metric to compare the opposing militaries? As a matter of fact, there is. The so-called Battle for the Konoko Fields, also known as the Battle of Kasham, which occurred in Syria in 2018. This was the first hot encounter between US and Russian forces since the Cold War. The US had stationed a handful of US Marines and Army Special Forces about five miles east of the Euphrates River close to a vital oil drilling and pumping station in eastern Syria to help support a small group of Syrian Democratic Forces SDF fighters, also defending the site primarily against ISIS threats in the region. Russian and US forces had previously agreed that a nominal dividing line between the two forces would be the Euphrates River. They had even set up a special hotline between the two areas' command units to make sure there wouldn't be any confusion on the ground, as the Russian troops were also ostensibly opposed to ISIS at the time. At around 5 a.m. on February 7, 2018, a force of some 250 mixed Russian Wagner mercenaries and Syrian pro-government militia attempted to cross the Euphrates southwest of Kasham. U.S. forces fired a few artillery rounds to warn them off, and they did pull back. But later in the evening around 10 p.m., the U.S. troops were surprised to detect a column of Russian T-72 tanks and support vehicles, along with as many as 500 soldiers, heading towards their position from the east side of the Euphrates. Sporadic artillery fire and mortar fire began to hit their positions as well. The U.S. troops followed procedure and contacted their opposite numbers using the predetermined hotline, but the Russian commanders assured them that there were no Russian troops in the area. With that reassurance, the U.S. troops called in massive air and artillery support involving F-15E and F-22 fighter jets, B-52 bombers, AC-130 gunships, AH-64 Apache attack helicopters, MQ-9 Reaper and RQ-7B shadow drones, in addition to M777 howitzer artillery and M142 HIMARS rockets. The Russian and Syrian forces never got to within rifle range of their US targets. Four hours later, when the fighting was over, more than 100 of the attacking forces had been killed, though some estimates put that loss at closer to 330. The only casualties on the US SDF side was a single wounded SDF soldier. The lopsided nature of the encounter due to primarily the overwhelming and accurately directed air and artillery strikes supplied by the US underscored the uneven nature of the current US and Russian military forces, as well as their relative abilities to use combined arms in a coordinated fashion. The massive response was also seen as a deliberate warning to Russia not to take the US or their allies lightly. That leads us inescapably to another interesting question. Could the US on its own invade and conquer the country of Russia? Alternatively, could the US, with NATO's help, conquer Russia? Bluntly, right now there's no way the US, even with NATO's help, could physically invade and conquer Russia. Even if Russia failed to use their nukes, and you can be certain they would, there's simply no way the vast country of Russia, stretching through 11 time zones, could ever be fully occupied and pacified. Hold on though, let's break this answer down and then we can talk about some other ways the US could possibly, actually, very probably destroy Russia. It's becoming clear in the modern age that no moderately well-supplied country would be able to be occupied and defeated as long as their people maintained the will to fight. A perfect example is the relatively tiny country of Vietnam. They were one of the first countries to soundly defeat the Mongol Empire in the 13th century and resisted French occupation right up until the Japanese invaded them in 1940. After the fall of Japan in 1945, they went on the offensive to drive the French out of their country. And when they were successful and the US tried to defend the area of South Vietnam, they fought for more than a decade before driving the US out as well, despite suffering as many as a million casualties. Cambodia next thought they could occupy Vietnam's Mekong Delta, but in a mere two weeks, the Vietnamese routed the attackers and occupied the capital, Phnom Penh, which they held until 1988. China then invaded, thinking that they could impose their will on the ruling Vietnamese government. But the Vietnamese went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the mighty Chinese army and after some brief but intense fighting, managed to force them to withdraw, though China considered the event merely a short, punitive expedition. Such determination to defend one's homeland would undoubtedly be faced in Russia as well, but of an order of magnitude far greater. 
Many segments of Russia see the current invasion of Ukraine and the implied aim of NATO to hang a strategic defeat around Putin's neck as one of an existential crisis for their country. Since Russian media is nothing more than an echo chamber for their dictator-in-chief, most commentators mirror Putin's own comments when he says that in light of such a defeat, I do not even know if such an ethnic group as the Russian people will be able to survive in the form in which it exists today. You can expect that, just as they did with their Herculean efforts to defend their country against the onslaught of Nazi Germany in World War II, Russia will fight on against any invasion, no matter the costs, the consequences, or the forces arrayed against them. They might even find a willing ally in China, who has been eyeing sections of Russia's Far East territories around Vladivostok that as recently as the 1850s were part of Greater China. It's entirely possible that China would be willing to help support the defense of Russia in exchange for what they currently consider historical Chinese territory. There is evidence that China has decided it's in their best interest to keep Russia as an intact nation in order to divide Western opposition. Both countries share an intense dislike of what they perceived as US hegemony throughout the world, and now that Russia has seen its oil and natural gas outlets in the West curtailed by sanctions, by necessity, they've had to turn to China and India as their two primary sources for exploiting petrochemicals. Even closer cooperation in the future is only inevitable. But wait, there's one more option. What if the US managed to topple the Russian government? This may be the trickiest of the three topics to answer. In short, yes, the US could probably topple the Putin government at any time if they wanted to. There was a recent event that showcased just how precise US strikes have become, an event that may have led Putin to decide to travel in a special armored train and to spend much of his time in isolated bunkers in Siberia, far from the active front lines. On August 2nd, 2022, the US sent a pair of specially modified Hellfire missiles to take out Ayman al-Zawahiri, one of the Al-Qaeda leaders responsible for planning various attacks on US and Western targets, including the 9-11 attacks, the bombing of the USS Cole, multiple bombings of US embassies in Africa, and others. He was tracked to a residence in Kabul, in the middle of a densely populated area. But the two drones were so precise that the US claimed Zawahiri was the only casualty of the operation. According to published reports, he was taken out while he stood on the second floor balcony of the residence with the missiles equipped with Ginsu knife-like projections. The strike was publicized in a series of press conferences, with additional US government officials warning that no matter how long it takes, no matter where you hide, if you are a threat to our people, the United States will find you and take you out. No doubt Putin took that threat seriously. But US military and diplomatic policy has matured since the 1950s and 60s when the CIA routinely toppled governments, many of them democratically elected, in countries like Iran, South Vietnam, Chile, Guatemala, the Congo, and others. Nowadays, the US prefers to let its military-industrial complex do the talking, such as when they toppled Saddam's regime in Iraq. In retrospect, despite the overwhelming military victory the US achieved, the end result was ultimately seen by many as seriously flawed as the US had no plan to replace the removed Iraqi government with any kind of stable and reliable replacement. And that may be the one main reason why the US doesn't want to topple the Putin dictatorship. There are fears that whoever might replace him could be far worse. The one element of his arsenal that Putin has dared not yet use is his nuclear arsenal. He probably knows that as long as he doesn't employ nukes, then the West will worry he's the only thing holding back a massive nuclear war. He's betting that the US and the West will worry that whoever comes next might not hold back. And so, we've come full circle. It's clear that the one ace in the hole that Russia still holds onto is its nuclear deterrent. Putin dare not use them, for fear that doing so will unleash a horrific response from the West. But Putin has to threaten to use them in fear that their possible use is the only thing keeping NATO from sending actual troops to drive the Russian invaders out of Ukraine. And the West dare not take Putin out directly, for fear that his replacement might be willing to use nukes in an act of suicidal revenge. And so, the world balances on a precarious knife's edge, closer to a nuclear holocaust than we've been since the Cuban Missile Crisis of the early 1960s. It would be best if all sides could take one giant step back from the precipice, but Putin seems incapable of backing down, and the brave Ukrainians are determined to take their country back, as well they should. The most likely outcome is that some oligarch will find a willing accomplice in Putin's cook staff, and the Russian president will succumb to a bout of severe intestinal distress following which, some level-headed replacement will endeavor to repair the massive damage Putin's done both to Ukraine and to his own country. At least, that's what many sane people hope. Don't forget, before he was the leader of the Wagner Group, the oligarch Yevgeny Prigozhin had a very special nickname, Putin's Chef. 
But what do you think? Could the US military conquer Russia all on its own? How would they do it? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. As if losing tanks by the dozens and terrified conscripts by the hundreds on a daily level wasn't bad enough, Putin has now been betrayed by one of his own. And you won't believe this guy's getaway story and what he revealed about the maniacal Russian dictator. Here's the thing. When you're fighting a war, information is everything. The more you know, the more effective you'll be on the battlefield. And if you're looking for an edge over your enemy, the best intelligence often comes from the source you least expect. One such example hit global newsrooms just recently when a high-ranking defector from Vladimir Putin's inner circle decided enough was enough and escaped to the West. How did he do it? Why did he do it? And most importantly, what did he reveal about Putin the leader and the state of his forces in Ukraine? Join us today and find out. In mid-October 2022, Gleb Karakulov, a member of Putin's elite personal security service, concocted a daring plan. A graduate of Russia's Mozhaisky Military Space Academy, he had risen through the ranks of Russia's Federal Guard Service, becoming a captain and engineer in the Presidential Communications Directorate. Impressive technical skills rewarded Gleb with important jobs. Among them, he became responsible for arranging and providing secure encrypted communications to and from Putin's presidential and the prime minister's office on their foreign visits. This role exposed Gleb to a flood of classified information, as well as the routine and private affairs of Putin's inner circle. Let's put it this way, Gleb found himself smack in the middle of information central, and it was a prestigious, important job, but one that soon began to grate against his moral compass. For Gleb, the February 2022 invasion changed everything. By late 2022, Putin's ruthless tactics, Russia's changing fortunes, and the criminality demonstrated by average Russian soldiers in their deployments to Ukraine caused many Russians to begin quietly opposing the war. Gleb himself never participated specifically in Russia's military activities, but racked by internal guilt and aware he was implicitly supporting an authoritarian regime bent on executing its leaders' criminal orders, he found himself among this group disillusioned by the brainwashing propaganda and hypocrisy at every level of society. What this guy did next took no small amount of courage. Just two years from retirement from the FSB, Gleb made a monumental decision. He decided he wanted out. I could no longer make compromises with myself, he later told interviewers. I couldn't remain in the service of this president. I consider him a war criminal. Even though I am not directly involved in this war, it's no longer possible for me to carry out his criminal orders or stay in his service. It wasn't only Putin's behavior that put Gleb off. During his travels in the initial phases of the war, Gleb noted how casually his FGS colleagues talked about the bloodshed and devastation Russian soldiers were inflicting on Ukraine. According to Gleb, they would savor every detail of what was happening in the war, even taking pleasure in these discussions. I can't describe how disgusting and unpleasant it was, he continued. I don't know, I had this feeling of total disgust. I decided to quit. We get it, Gleb, and we're with you on this. His decision coincided with Putin's September mobilization order that raised a new wave of Russian conscripts for frontline service in Ukraine. This posed a major problem for Gleb. He could terminate his contract, but if he left the service he knew under the mobilization he would immediately become a reserve officer, consigned to the front after his discharge. He would not be party to a criminal war, on or behind the front lines. It was as simple as that. So with his decision made, what would he do next? The problem was picking the right moment. Gleb had an incredibly important job. Every time the Russian president or prime minister traveled anywhere, he would go ahead as the leader of an advanced team, with enough specialized communications equipment to fill a Kamaz truck. Over 13 years, Gleb made more than 180 trips, each ensuring Russia's political elite could safely communicate with their colleagues from anywhere in the world. Because of his routine travels, he decided the best time to escape would be when he was far from the Russian metropole, at least far enough to be near somewhere with an airport that could get him into a pro-Western country. But he had to pace himself. Timing was everything. In October 2022, the opportunity finally presented itself. Here's how he pulled it off, and it's genius. Russian heads of state were scheduled to fly to Astana, the capital of Kazakhstan 
to attend a regional diplomatic summit. Naturally, Gleb went ahead to ensure Putin and his staff's communications were securely installed. It was there, however, where Gleb hatched his wily plan. On the final day of his business trip, he told his colleagues he wanted to go souvenir shopping after his shift. While there, he prepared the next phase of his plan, the getaway itself. When colleagues began texting him asking where he was shopping so they could meet up with him, he told them he had developed stomach cramps and needed to rest in his hotel room. Little did they know, Gleb was already on his way. That afternoon, he picked up his wife and daughter, who had come to Astana under the pretense of visiting Gleb, took a taxi to the airport, and prepared to board a flight to Istanbul, Turkey. Gleb must have been feeling the pressure at this point. His colleagues would soon become suspicious. The minutes ticked by. The passengers prepared to board. And then, an unexpected announcement made Gleb's heart sink. The flight was briefly delayed. He had to act quickly. Knowing his colleagues would be looking for him, Gleb turned off his phone. There was no turning back now. An hour later, he boarded the plane with his family. Relief swept over him and his wife as the flight attendants sealed the door. He had made it, but he was now a wanted man. Gleb Karakulov's escape officially made him the highest-ranking intelligence officer in Russia's recent past to defect to the West. By the time he landed, his phone had been bombarded with messages asking him where he was and what he was doing. Others who had caught on labeled him a traitor. His FGS operations department officer tried to get in touch. Gleb never responded. In Istanbul, Gleb and his family were met by Katya Hakim, a member of the Dossier Center, a London-based group funded by Russian opposition figure Mikhail Khodorovsky. The Dossier Center transported Gleb to a secure flat in an undisclosed location and began to meet with him in person. He agreed to give an exclusive interview before going public. Gleb was clear on his rationale for giving such a high-profile interview so soon after his escape. Russia's illegal invasion and occupation of Ukraine has thus far divided Russian officials, politicians, and elites, but until now, few have had the courage or audacity to publicly condemn Putin's actions. Gleb told his interviewers he wanted to speak out to express his opposition to the war in Ukraine. Above all, he wanted to tell his Federal Guard colleagues and all Russian citizens to do something, that they should not believe the war has anything to do with Ukrainian aggression. So what did Gleb say? Ironically, the biggest and most oft-repeated observation from the interview came as the least surprising. Since the start of the war in Ukraine, Putin's paranoia has gone into overdrive. Putin is pathologically afraid for his life. He spends most of his time at his residences, reinforced safe houses the media has aptly labeled bunkers. This is hardly shocking. Self-preservation is priority number one in every dictator's handbook. But Putin seems to take it to another level, leading an isolated, cocooned existence cut off from reality. Putin does not use a mobile phone. At least, Gleb had never once seen him with one in all his years of service. And why would he? Mobile phones can be hacked, bugged, or compromised, an unnecessary security risk for heads of state. Gleb said that contrary to Putin, whenever the Russian prime minister goes on business trips, a senior aide in charge of internet access will accompany them using a laptop with secure access to look things up as necessary. Putin requires nothing of the sort. What's the point of the internet for Putin, Gleb remarked. He only receives information from his closest circle, which means that he lives in an information vacuum. This is worth exploring more. In his self-incurred isolation, the Russian president essentially gets his information from three sources. One, his inner circle. Yes, men who tell him everything he wants to hear. Two, authorized reports from his military intelligence and security services, and three, yes, you guessed it, Russian propaganda. Putin insists on having a Russian TV everywhere he goes, and this is significant. He loves watching his own sensationalized propaganda espoused by raging pundits who exaggerate the nobility of Putin's war and minimize its global repercussions. We all know someone like this. People who spend so much time in their own echo chambers they become convinced they are the only ones who can see the world as it really is. The irony is that the more they feed themselves information from one side, the more unbalanced their perspective becomes. Putin takes this to the extreme. We shouldn't be surprised, but it has been said that many of the reports he reads from his intelligence services are extremely flawed. Allegedly, an FGS report issued before the war claimed the Ukrainian people would greet Russian troops as liberators, something we now know turned out to be completely false. But this report was apparently a key factor in Putin's decision to invade to begin with, a misguided venture that has resulted in the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people, with no end in sight. Putin's paranoia manifests itself in other ways too. 
According to Gleb, Putin is so self-isolating he continues to observe strict quarantine procedures, interweaving peak pandemic COVID precautions into his own personal security routine. We have to observe strict quarantine for two weeks before any event, even those lasting 15 to 20 minutes, Gleb said. There is a pool of employees who have been cleared, who underwent two-week quarantine. They are considered clean and can work in the same room as Putin. When asked whether the staff questioned these measures, Gleb responded that everyone was a little perplexed as to why this is still going on, because everyone has been forced to get vaccinated. Everyone undergoes health screenings, monitors their health, and takes regular tests. I know that all of the president's aides take PCR tests several times a day. I have no idea why, he's probably just worried about his health. Perhaps Putin isn't wrong to be overly cautious, with millions of people who would gladly take his life. Given the chance, there may be a method to his madness. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. Putin's paranoia manifests itself not only in his behavior and his relationships, but in the places he occupies and the vehicles that move him from one place to the next. Having had to install encrypted communications on a range of non-stationary facilities ranging from planes, helicopters, trains and yachts, Gleb noted that Putin has contingency plans in place for almost every conceivable situation. One of Putin's preferred modes of transport of late is a specialized armored train, which Gleb noted appeared on his FGS schedule sometime between 2014 and 2015. The train is unremarkable at first glance, bearing the same appearance as an ordinary train, the same as all the other Russian railway trains, he said, gray with a red stripe. The front of Putin's train is what distinguishes it from any other. Its two engine cars constitute the main armored element, bulkier and beefier than traditional engines. These contain encrypted communication systems and armored plating. Putin frequently uses the train for travel, but it enables him to hide in plain sight. Planes show up on certain services and networks, whereas a train, how many of these gray trains are there? Most importantly, they cannot be tracked on any information resource. It's done for stealth purposes. Between August and September 2021, Putin began using his train far more regularly. The FGS guards had to be quarantined for two weeks prior to any journey. Putin's background as a KGB agent certainly informs his paranoia playbook. For example, he has a unique way of staving off eavesdroppers and bugs when he travels abroad. He takes a soundproof telephone booth with him everywhere he goes, ensuring he can speak with complete confidentiality. When asked about the booth, Gleb said it is bulky. It's a cube about 2.5 meters high. Inside there is a workstation and a telephone, which one can use to talk without fear of those conversations being overheard or read by foreign intelligence. On top of this, like any head of state, Putin has contingency plans in place in case an attempt is made on his life. Gleb said that on a visit to Kazakhstan, he and his team rigged up a communications array in a bunker under the Russian embassy as an added precaution. It's a kind of paranoia. You are on another state's soil, Gleb observed, questioning Putin's motives. The state is the summit's convener, providing all the security. The embassy territory itself is also guarded, another precaution to ensure the president can be whisked to a safe location in a flash. Were a nuclear exchange ever to take place, Putin would likely take shelter in his airborne bunker, a modified four-engined Ilyushin Il-86 jetliner known as the Flying Kremlin, or more colloquially, Putin's doomsday plane. The aircraft was designed during the Cold War to protect Russian leadership in a worst-case scenario. With in-air refueling capabilities, no external windows save those in the cockpit, and a modified radome, with a special communications array protruding from its fuselage, Putin's secure aerial command post is designed to withstand extreme weather and electromagnetic and nuclear blasts. The United States also has a four-plane fleet of similar aircraft, most notably, a modified Boeing 747 known as the E-4B Nightwatch, kept fueled and ready for any situation. One of the most interesting observations was how Putin likes to make it look like he is more active than he really is. Ever since the war began, the Russian president has spent more and more time locked away in his secure residences in St. Petersburg, Sochi, or Novgorod. Interestingly, each of his offices in these locations is designed to be identical, so that Putin can appear to be in one place but really work from another. There were times when I know he was in Sochi. The TV is on in the background, the news is on, and they show him conducting a meeting in Novo Agariovo. So I asked a colleague in Sochi, has he left already? 
No, he says, he's still here. The guy used to joke that when Putin was in Sochi, they would deliberately pretend that he was leaving. They would bring a plane, a motorcade would set off, while in actual fact, he would stay in Sochi. I mean, the guys would talk about it, almost laughing. This is a ruse to confuse foreign intelligence in the first place, and secondly, to prevent any attempts on his life. Speaking of Putin being active or not, with all the rumors about his health decreasing over the past few years, you may be wondering about his physical shape. Here's the scoop. One of the informant's most surprising revelations has to do with Putin's physical fitness. Many have long suspected that Putin has been in bad shape. Videos showing the Russian president's unnatural arm and leg twitching and alarming facial expressions fuel the fire of speculation. Some believe he has early-onset Parkinson's disease. Others posit it as blood cancer, but Gleb cast doubts on these claims. I can tell you that I went on many business trips with him, and he went on many trips before 2020. After that, he stayed in his bunker and maybe made just one, maximum three, business trips a year. Given the fact that there have been many business trips, only one or two were cancelled because of his health. When asked to clarify, Gleb added that over a span of 13 years since 2009, just two back-to-back -back business trips were cancelled owing to illness. He is in better health than many other people of his age, he said, citing his annual medical checkups. Vladimir Putin is probably not going to die anytime soon, a dossier center analyst told a CNN reporter. Gleb spoke to Putin's work ethic. He is a hard worker, sometimes working until 2 or 3 a.m. on business trips and holding meetings abroad in the middle of the night to coincide with daytime hours in Moscow. Okay, so far we've learned a lot about the Russian dictator and his creepy little habits. So what does this lunatic actually have planned for Ukraine? Gleb confessed that while he believed Putin would do something in Ukraine, he never believed it would evolve into a full-scale war. To him, something happened. The energetic and active former head of the FSB and prime minister turned president, once involved in global affairs, suddenly shut himself off from the world in 2020, erecting all kinds of barriers, the quarantine, the information vacuum, his reality became distorted. A sane person in the 21st century who looks objectively at everything happening in the world, let alone who can predict developments, at least in the medium term, would not have allowed this war to happen, Gleb claims. His dismay that nearly all of his FGS colleagues maintained unwavering support for Putin as the war escalated is palpable in his interview. To him, average Russians will struggle to separate fact from fiction as long as they stay glued to their Russian state TVs. His own wife, he said, would never have understood how information was distorted had he not told her how different things were in reality. I don't want to think about it, but if I hadn't been an officer in the FGS, I'm horrified to admit that I might have been a Z patriot or whatever they're called, because I'd be watching TV. The excessive spending to preserve one man's lavish lifestyle private luxury getaways for oligarchs and friends of Putin's, the chronic misuse of Russian taxpayer money, it all started to get to Gleb. He devoted the final part of his exclusive interview to his FGS colleagues. He exhorted them to recognize their privileged position, to see things as they really were and speak out against Putin's war. How many nameless victims of this war are there? How many of them are children? How many more such victims are required before you stop putting up with it? What is happening now in Ukraine all this destruction, this war of aggression, terrorism, and genocide of all Ukrainian people, all this is a criminal offense. Our president has become a war criminal. You have to stop following these criminal orders. But the most important motive for him remains his family. I consider it my goal that my child does not know these horrors of war, so that the state, which interferes in every possible way in the upbringing of children, does not touch her, so that she can grow up in a calm environment and will be able to grow up as a person and realize herself. It is a dignified, noble, and honorable cause. We hope that in time, Gleb's decision to defect will be vindicated in Ukraine's assured sovereignty and the end of Putin's war as we know it. But what do you think? Will Putin's madness eventually cause him to self-destruct, or will it continue to aid him in his maniacal conquering plans? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. China's navy is catching up to the US, but while China's naval capability has come a long way from the third Taiwan crisis, its apparent strength is not all it seems. Here's why. Here are two of the most powerful countries in the world. Both China, the fourth largest country in terms of area spanning approximately 3.7 million square miles, and the United States, which is the third largest country by land area covering about 3.8 million square miles, 
are major economic powers with substantial global significance. China has the world's second largest economy with a GDP of approximately $18.1 trillion in 2022. The United States, however, has the largest economy globally with a GDP of about $25.46 trillion in 2022. Okay, so the US has got China whipped when it comes to land area size and economic success, but what about military power? Well, here's where it gets scary. China aims to position itself as a significant global military power and has set its sights on achieving global dominance by 2049. Right now, China's Air Force ranks second globally, just behind the United States, which possesses the most formidable Air Force strength. According to reports, the United States operates approximately 10,000 more air platforms compared to China. In terms of total aircraft strength, China is listed as having 3,260 aircraft in service, while the United States boasts an impressive fleet of 13,233 aircraft. This substantial difference emphasizes the United States' superior air power and its larger operational aircraft count. But what about sea power? One of the markers of a superpower is the ability to project maritime power over long distances. States which have been able to do so have enormous influence in regional or world affairs and can exert huge leverage over their less capable rivals. It is therefore not surprising that as China's wealth has grown, it has invested heavily in its ambitions to create a blue water navy that it hopes will one day challenge the US Navy for supremacy, at least within the waters of its immediate neighborhood. But how close is China to that goal? What is the state of US-China strategic competition at sea and how is the United States planning to maintain its lead on the world's waterways? What technologies and weapons is the US Navy developing to adapt to the growing power of China's People's Liberation Army Navy PLAN. You may have heard reports that China now has the world's largest navy. There are 355 ships in its fleet as of December 30th, 2021. The Chinese brass is keen to expand that number. It plans to increase its fleet size to 420 ships by 2025 and 460 ships by 2030. These figures do not cover the additional 85 patrol combatant ships and other small ships capable of bearing anti-ship cruise missiles. China's countless fishing boats have also acted as a de facto maritime militia, harassing vessels from other countries in international waters. China's navy has the numbers, but here's the bad news. It is increasing in the quality of its ships as well. China was seen putting its new naval muscle to use in the summer of 2022, following a visit by then House Speaker Nancy Pelosi to Taiwan. For several days after Pelosi left, Chinese ships and aircraft demonstrated their military potential in the waters off Taiwan. This show of force would have been inconceivable 25 years earlier, in the third Taiwan Strait Crisis of 1995-96. At the time, when Taiwan was set to hold its first direct presidential election and became a fully-fledged democracy, the mainland launched several missiles across the Taiwan Strait, prompting the United States to send two carrier battle groups to the area. China had no choice but to back down in the face of such pressure, but the Chinese leadership never forgot the incident. To them, it recalled the century of humiliation, a time in the 19th and early 20th centuries when China repeatedly found itself at the mercy of foreign powers. Since the Chinese leadership considers Taiwan a rogue province, continued American and allied military support for the island reminds them of those times. After the crisis, China resolved to never let such a scenario happen again and took steps to increase its naval power. This was a deviation from the norm. With only a few brief exceptions, China has never historically been a sea power. It has traditionally focused its military resources on maintaining a large army capable of defending its vast land borders. Up until recently, this was the objective of the Chinese brass. However, with China's continued problems with Taiwan and its containment within the natural barrier of the first island chain, a string of islands off China's waters which stretch from Japan to Indonesia, the Chinese leadership decided that only by becoming a sea power would China take its rightful place as a true global superpower. With its growing economic might, especially since it joined the World Trade Organization in 2001, China finally had the chance to make a play for naval prominence. Included in China's new naval assets are three aircraft carriers. China's naval brass plans to increase that number and bring its carrier force up to five by 2030, with more to come after that. The PLAN also aims to increase its submarine force by building 10 ballistic missile submarines by the same year. While China's naval capability has come a long way from the third Taiwan crisis, its apparent strength is not all it seems. China may have more vessels in its fleets than any other country, 
but that is because most of the ships are still small. Aside from the number of ships, one way to measure a state's naval power is through the combined tonnage of its fleets. Tonnage is the measurement of a ship's weight. The PLAN's total combined tonnage as of 2020 is between 1.8 and 2 million tons. The US Navy, though, stands at 4.6 million tons. The reason why tonnage matters is because small, low-quality vessels do comparatively little in actual naval confrontation. The United States could build many more smaller boats if it wanted to, but instead focuses on sturdier vessels with advanced offensive and defensive weaponry and robust transit options for Marines to stage amphibious assaults. While many American policymakers have called for the United States to build more ships and restore the Navy to Cold War-level fleet sizes, no one in Washington is calling for an imitation of China's fleet composition. Small patrol boats and other irregular craft do the US Navy no good in its global mission to maintain secure and free navigation on the world's oceans. China has closed the tonnage gap since the time of the Third Taiwan Strait Crisis, when the United States had a total tonnage lead of over 4 million, but it still lags significantly behind. China's Navy has other problems. Two of its much-publicized aircraft carriers are older models that use a stowbar, short takeoff but arrested recovery system to launch its planes. China's third aircraft carrier, the Fujian, uses a more modern catapult system comparable to those used by the US Navy's carriers, which allows it to launch its onboard planes faster. The Fujian is therefore a significant step in China's technological capability. However, how would China be able to launch its planes without pilots to fly them? China has a serious shortage of trained naval aviators, and the Fujian and its successors will add to the stress both in the number of pilots these new carriers will demand and in teaching them how to use the catapult system. Overall, the PLAN is many decades behind the US Navy's institutional knowledge and experience. Case in point, it lacks a fighter made specifically for training carrier pilots. The current aircraft of choice is the JL-9G, a single-engine, twin-seat plane that is incapable of simulating emergency landings on a carrier's flight deck because it is too light and slow. So far, the PLAN's attempts to create an adequate training aircraft have fallen short of satisfactory. Establishing programs for cadet naval aviators has also proven difficult for the PLAN. This lack of institutional knowledge and experience makes sense, given China's history and its only recent move towards sea power. Unfortunately for the Chinese leadership, institutional knowledge doesn't come as easily as new ships do. China might have made progress at a rapid pace, but in a confrontation between carrier groups as they currently stand, the United States would still have an overwhelming advantage, for a few reasons. First, the United States has many more advanced fourth-generation and fifth-generation fighters to call upon. America's arsenal includes not only carrier-based planes, but land-based F-22s that would fly from Japan to lend a hand in a real battle. China's most advanced fighter, on the other hand, the J-20, cannot be launched from a carrier, and it's unclear if it can rival America's F-22 and F-35, in air-to-air -air combat. Meanwhile, upgraded Tomahawk cruise missiles and submarines would also pose significant threats to the burgeoning Chinese carrier force. Although we do not have good knowledge of the extent of China's electronic warfare capabilities, which could potentially counter such ship and submarine-fired missiles if they are advanced enough. Another area that the PLAN significantly lags behind the US Navy in is submarines which was one of the reasons why Beijing made such a big protest about the AUKUS submarine sharing agreement. China currently has a fleet of 56 submarines. Six of them are ballistic missile submarines with payloads capable of reaching the United States homeland. Another six are nuclear-powered attack submarines. The bulk of the fleet, 44, are diesel-electric attack submarines. This is where China's navy is at its most pronounced disadvantage and lags the furthest behind. Experts believe that China's current main submarine, the Shang class, is only on par with 1970s Soviet-era designs, and China has not invested as much in anti-submarine warfare as in other parts of its naval buildup. It has tried to close the gap recently, equipping its newer surface ships with more sophisticated sonars. China has also introduced its new U-8 missile launch torpedo and KQ-200 maritime patrol aircraft. Even so, these are comparative baby steps in actually defeating the formidable American submarine force. China may also be able to deploy more submarines in its immediate waters, but it is still at a severe disadvantage in submarine-to-submarine -submarine warfare. A comparison of the engineering of the two navies' underwater vessels will paint a clearer picture of why the US Navy still has a decisive advantage in undersea warfare. 
The United States uses nuclear-powered submarines, which are faster, capable of diving deeper, and have a longer range than the submarines China uses. China's diesel-electric-based submarines have one advantage. When running on electric power, they are quieter than nuclear submarines. However, these vessels cannot run on electric power for long. They have to either surface or pop up a snorkel to recharge their electric batteries and run on diesel power for the duration of that operation. At that point, they are significantly noisier than nuclear subs and far more vulnerable to attack. Meanwhile, nuclear submarines can stay quiet and deep for months on end. Although the range and duration of operations would not necessarily be as important for the Chinese in a confrontation with the US Navy because hostile encounters would take place near Chinese waters, the depth, stealth ability, and operating times of the American and Allied nuclear submarines would help to defeat China's strategy of overwhelming enemy naval forces with a reign of anti-access area denial ballistic missiles. These projectiles currently pose a severe threat to American carrier groups and surface ships operating too close to China's waters. Submarines, on the other hand, are much harder to detect, and the US Navy's advantage in underwater operations allows the United States to threaten the Chinese mainland. As with aircraft carriers, China intends to build new next-generation submarines. By 2030, it could have between 30 and 40 nuclear-powered submarines. Whether it will have the institutional know-how to recruit and train competent submariners may be a more difficult matter to determine. China's current underwater deficiencies notwithstanding, it is still eager to flex its submarine muscle and has begun keeping at least one of its nuclear-armed ballistic missile submarines at sea at all times, with near-continuous patrols into the hotly contested waters of the South China Sea, making things more difficult for the United States and its allies and the waters of the region more dangerous. It is a sign of what the PLAN seeks for the future. As things stand now, though, China tacitly acknowledges its disadvantages in maritime warfare and relies mostly on a defensive strategy to mitigate the threat that the US Navy poses. At the heart of its strategy are various classes of land-based short- and medium-range ballistic missiles. These missiles, based in mainland China and on its illegally built artificial islands in the South China Sea, pose a serious threat to American surface ships operating in the waters of the first island chain. Most formidable is its vast stockpile of short-range missiles, effective at distances up to 1,000 kilometers. The US Department of Defense estimates that China has between 750 and 1,500 of these, and they pose a menacing threat to Taiwan and every American base in Japan and South Korea too. China also has between 150 and 450 medium-range and 80 to 160 intermediate-range ballistic missiles respectively. These missiles can reach American ships and assets much further away from China's mainland. Some of them are capable of hitting Guam, the largest base in the region. China is currently building more ballistic missiles in an attempt to exert leverage over progressively more distant areas of the Indo-Pacific region. Additionally, although the PLAN is not currently capable of defeating the US Navy in a head-to-head -head confrontation, China would have the advantage of operating near its territory in any real conflict. No one on either side expects a midway-style battle on the high ocean. This reality means that the American supply lines would be much longer and more vulnerable to Chinese ballistic missile attacks, the tyranny of distance. China would also be able to concentrate all of its naval assets in a confrontation with the United States, where in contrast, the latter has global commitments. Policymakers and war planners in Washington have long sought to concentrate resources in the Indo-Pacific region to counter China's expansionism but bureaucratic and international resistance have often thwarted those plans, with Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine putting even more pressure on the United States to maintain military forces in Europe at high levels. Between these commitments, China's sheer number of assets, the tricky supply situation, and China's continued buildup in quality and quantity, the US Navy cannot rely on maintaining its traditional superiority forever, and the stakes are getting higher. Many experts warn that slowly but surely, the United States is losing its traditional military advantage in the Indo-Pacific region, and the cost of victory in any potential confrontation with China has become much higher than even a decade ago. So what is the United States doing to keep its edge at sea in a time of growing competition? No American naval strategy in the Indo-Pacific region would come independent of the consideration of its allies, especially Japan. So what would be their contributions to the naval balance of power in the Indo-Pacific? Japan recently announced that it would spend 2% of its GDP on defense by 2027, lifting traditional post-World War II restrictions to build a military capable of offensive operations. 
A new aircraft carrier, the country's first since World War II, is included in those plans. Even so, decades of minimal defense spending and the loss of institutional know-how will not be overcome so easily. Some American policymakers and national security experts fear that the benefit of Japan's renewed commitment to its military will only show up well after 2027, when China's capabilities will be even higher than they are today. Other American allies in the region like Taiwan and the Philippines are not nearly as capable. South Korea has a strong army but is not in a position to play a robust role in a sea confrontation with the growing strength of the PLAN. This reality means that the increasingly precarious situation will remain intact for the time being, with the overwhelming share of the Indo-Pacific's defense burden falling on the United States. One of the items on the US Navy's intermediate horizon is to arm its Zumwalt-class destroyers with hypersonic missiles by 2025. Tests of some ship-fired devices are currently scheduled for later that year. This weapon, called the Intermediate Range Conventional Prompt Strike, is a non-nuclear missile with a glide vehicle exceeding Mach 5 and a range of over 1,700 kilometers. The US Navy is also experimenting with ship-fire laser weapons that could act as a much better line of defense against China's big arsenal of ballistic missiles. The Navy received its first Helios, high-energy laser with integrated optical dazzler and surveillance system in the third quarter of fiscal year 2022 and has requested $35 million worth of them in its 2023 budget. The Helios system is ideal for countering anti-ship missiles and can do so cheaply because lasers do not require stockpiles of ammunition, which can be expensive to manufacture and transport. Helios instead uses power from the ship itself and does not require a separate energy magazine, making each shot extremely cheap. The US Navy hopes that such cheap laser shots will one day efficiently nullify the much more expensive missiles they will be targeting. Helios is currently designed for integration on Burke and Arleigh class ships, but the Navy is planning to adapt it elsewhere. Unlike with hypersonic missiles, the United States currently leads China in laser technology, but China is proceeding apace with its own plans. As drones and missiles get more sophisticated, laser countermeasures will only be more important in the future. The Navy had been experimenting with railguns, electromagnetic projectile weapons, for more than a decade, but suspended the program in 2021 in favor of hypersonic missiles. Suspension does not mean permanent consignment, however, and the Navy might pick the program back up. Like lasers, railguns have the advantage of not needing to carry as big of an ammunition magazine, since their projectiles are not launched with gunpowder or fuel, but electromagnetic power that can be generated from the host ship. Drones are also set to play a big part in the future of naval operations, including drone ships and submarines, such as the experimental Orca, which will have a range of 6,500 nautical miles and be able to run alone for several months. The Navy plans for Orcas to be capable of anti-submarine warfare, with MK-46 or MK-48 heavy torpedoes. They are even being designed to carry anti-ship missiles. Unmanned ships and submarines would at the very least be expendable targets for China to send its heavy stockpile of ballistic missiles at, reducing the high American casualties that they would otherwise cause and permit the United States to grow bolder as the Chinese deplete their stockpiles. As we have seen in the war in Ukraine, ammunition gets depleted quickly in a modern conflict. Ammunition which is often expensive to make, with its precision instruments and advanced electronics. Any cheap drone which can exhaust China's advanced munitions would be worth its weight in gold for the American naval brass. China is also keen on developing unmanned submersibles, signaling that this will be a burgeoning area of competition between the two rivals in the Indo-Pacific region. Drone carriers, unmanned ships, and unmanned submersibles are not the only aspects of science fiction that are quickly becoming a reality, however. Jetpacks are one of the more unusual ways that the US Navy is planning to maintain its maritime edge. Since their inceptions, the Navy and Marine Corps have been designed to work together. Supporting amphibious operations is one of the Navy's most important missions. One of the ways the Navy is planning to continue with this tradition is by experimenting with jetpacks. The jet suits the US Navy and its ally the Royal Navy is experimenting with can reach speeds of 85 miles per hour and altitudes of 12,000 feet. The US Navy was evidently inspired by the Iron Man movies. The Iron Man suits are powered by five gas turbine jet engines and weigh about 75 pounds when they have full tanks. Jet fuel, diesel, or even kerosene are all acceptable fuels. A test of a similar jet suit by the Royal Marines showed that these devices can be operated with a high degree of precision, enabling a wearer to take off from a speedboat and land on the deck of a much larger vessel. 
Although these prototype Iron Man suits are noisy, there will be less of a need for stealth in any real-world situation that they'd be used in. If naval combat gets to the point where one side is trying to board the enemy's ships, stealth is long gone. The Iron Man suits could also support amphibious operations, with US naval vessels launching marines at targeted areas. Imagine hundreds of them storming towards a shore. They would be much harder to target than helicopters or landing craft. Already, paramedics in Great Britain have used the jet suit to reach difficult places, and firefighters are also interested in the suit's ability to help them access hard areas rapidly. Though the world isn't quite ready for it yet, we probably aren't too far away from a world where swarms of marines decked out in Iron Man suits will take to the skies at low altitude. Because a naval confrontation between the US Navy and the PLAN would occur in the comparatively confined waters of the first island chain and not on the high seas, the Iron Man suit could prove an effective method of projecting force. The US Navy remains the world's premier maritime fighting force, but as China's wealth and power continues to grow, and as the PLAN continues to modernize, the United States must continue to look for ways to push the envelope. With innovations that we might find hard to believe now, China wants to break out of the first island chain and have more of a voice in the waters of the world. The United States wants to contain China within the waters close to its territory. Whoever holds the edge in the technology race will come closest to achieving their respective goal. But what do you think? In a battle between the US and Chinese Navy, who would win? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts.